Okay, we are going to get started. Welcome, everyone. Today is Tuesday, June 27th, 2023. This is our work session. I am calling the meeting to order, and notice is hereby given to the members of the City Council and the general public that at this work session, the City Council may vote to go into executive session, which will not be open to the public, for discussion and consultation with the city's attorneys, for legal advice on any item listed on the following agenda. Can we have roll call? Mayor Daggett. Here. Vice Mayor Aslan. Present. Councilmember Harris. Here. Councilmember Hallis. Here. Councilmember Matthews. Here. Councilmember McCarthy. Here. Councilmember Sweet. Here. And Councilmember House, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? It's my honor, Mayor. Thank you. Please stand if you're able. Councilmember Matthews, would you read our mission statement? It'd be my honor. The mission of the City of Flagstaff is to protect and enhance the quality of life for all. Thank you. And Vice Mayor, would you read our land acknowledgement? Flagstaff City Council humbly acknowledges the ancestral homelands of this area's indigenous nations and original stewards. These lands, still inhabited by native descendants, border mountains sacred to indigenous peoples. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will forever know this place as home. Thank you. All right, we're moving down to item number four, public participation. This enables the public to address the council about items that are not on the prepared agenda. Public participation appears on the agenda twice, now at the beginning and at the end of the work session. You may speak at one or the other, but not both. Anyone wishing to comment at the meeting is asked to fill out a speaker card. They're located in the back and submit it to the recording clerk. You have three minutes and there is a uh, little timer right here. And I am going to start with Janine Kelly. Janine Susie Kelly. Hello friends, it's so nice to see you. Abraham Lincoln believed that the purpose of government was to solve problems that the individual alone could not. Flagstaff endures an annual summer transient crisis in which transients hitchhike from Flagstaff to Flagstaff from Phoenix to escape the heat. Some transients have targeted and attacked innocent women on the urban trail near University Heights all the way up to Fort Tuthill and in the Bashes and Walmart parking lots located near I-17 and I-40. Some, not all of the transients, are dangerous and unstable, possibly mentally ill, or off their meds, and some are severely addicted to alcohol and drugs. So I ask with all my heart that Mayor Becky work with the Mayor of Phoenix to legally, compassionately, and pragmatically solve the annual summer transient crisis. Every human being needs water, food, shelter, meaningful work, and human connection. But men who harm women are cowards, and they belong in prison. And isn't it wiser to prevent a crime and a tragedy than to respond to one? So I'm advocating for the immediate emergency funding for the police department to enable the buffest, most Thor-like police officers to patrol the urban trail on mountain bikes to protect joggers, dog walkers, cyclists, birders, and hikers. Twice I've observed tents on the urban trail. If a campfire is started on the urban trail and goes rogue, it could destroy the University Heights neighborhood. An athletic neighbor in her 20s cycling home from her biology lab was yanked off her mountain bike on the urban trail in front of Beulah. A neighbor with a black belt in martial arts who is so physically fit she could have starred in the Philzema was hunted by two thugs on the, on the urban trail in her morning run. On walk-up drive, my neighbors discovered a transient tent camping in their backyard. A filthy transient was bathing in the women's room in the downtown library. During the winter, a transient was sleeping in the alcove of the Klein Library. When I reported it to the staff during the Tuesday night films, his feckless response was, oh, he's our buddy, he's our friend. And I replied, have you run a background check? Burning at Willow Bend one morning, I observed a transient in a sleeping bag under the pavilion next to the police station on Sawmill. Winter passed, I drove to Bashes early in the morning to get milk for my coffee, and when I parked 
Five Navajo men surrounded my car and began banging on the windows. On April 23rd, for a darling puppy that I am fostering. And in my efforts to elude a transient, this is what happened to me. Would you want your daughter, your sister, your mother, your wife, your grandmother to look like that? A kind Thank you, Janine. Barrett Kirk. And I need the photos. Mayor, council members, um, my name is Barrett Kirk. I'm with McGrath Real Estate Partners. Uh, we are the developer of the Alara at the Sawmill. It's been four years, almost to the day, that we received final development approval right here at this podium. So uh, I just wanted to report it's been a long four years, but we are finally complete, and uh, we hope we've uh, developed a project that you all and this city of Flagstaff can be very proud of. I know we are. Uh, you should have received an invitation, but I would personally like to invite you to a, a, a not a really a grand opening, but just an open house uh, event that we could show and give tours of the development. And um, I hope you can join us after after this this uh, this meeting. But uh, uh, you are all personally invi invited, along with anyone from the city. Also, would like to just uh, 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 express our deepest uh, gratitude to everyone we've worked with at the city. Uh, Flagstaff, they, uh, everyone here has been uh, professional and a pleasure to work with. So thank you very much. Thank you. Nadine Hart. Hello. Okay. So I'm here to address the issue of Section 8. And I don't want to end up camping with my family two steps away from homelessness with the transients we just heard from. But it is a reality. In our current real estate situation, someone like me who is coming out of homelessness from a domestic violence situation with no family, I have a one in 100,000th of a chance to succeed, but I need a home. I am not a victim, I am a consequence of leaving a very volatile man with my children. And I came here and embraced the kindness of this community. When you guys rally, you rally. So right now, my townhouse is for sale. It is for sale, and I have been rejected numerous times based on my voucher. As I stated last time, Maricopa and Tucson both allow this to count as income. Flagstaff is not doing this at this point. And I saw that Governor Hobbs was up here looking at the homelessness um, situation. And I just sit here and I wonder why not. I look at all of you that are here today. I voted for some of you, some I did not, but you are all very impassionate on helping your community. And I want you to ask yourself, what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? Tackling the war on poverty just by a simple vote to make it illegal to discriminate economically on families that have this voucher? Poverty doesn't discriminate against race, sex, religion. Everyone is two steps from it. Or do you want to be remembered for the pickleball wars? This is a very serious thing and it's very unpopular, but you're not sitting here because you wanted to be popular. You came here because you care about your community. You have pride in your community. Um, so I'm asking you today to consider making it illegal to discriminate. I was told that the CEO of Housing Solutions was here in January and February and nothing has changed. I was here five years ago, nothing has changed. She told me in my home, while we were having pictures taken, which is very humiliating for a family of PTSD, that she kind of gave up on it. 
I don't want to give up on this. It's a very simple solution. The answer has to be yes. Flagstaff is known for its kindness and compassion to its people. I'm surprised that Phoenix has beat us out on this very topic. So with that being said, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Nadine. Jennifer Katra. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. While it may look like I'm alone here this afternoon, believe me, I am not alone. There are easily 800 to 1,000 pickleball players in Flagstaff, and that number continues to grow by the week. As I've listened to your recent discussions regarding NAH, what I hear is support from the Council for the idea that the city needs to be forward-thinking, meeting the needs of the community as it grows, noting that while perhaps not everyone is supportive of the plan, the Council supports it because it is what is best for the community as a whole. I suggest to you that that is exactly the thinking that's needed in next week's pickleball discussion. The pickleball complex developed with the current funding needs to be robust enough to meet the needs of the rapidly growing pickleball community. Not just for this year or the next few years, but in light of the almost $1 million price tag for ideally the next 10 years or so. A project that fails to meet the needs of the community just means revisiting these discussions sooner rather than later. The Bushmaster complex under consideration is a 16 court complex. That is the minimum number of courts that will be needed over the next 10 years. In fact, already there are days that all 16 courts would be full. One of the reasons Bushmaster has been considered the ideal location for this project is that because of the eight dual stripe courts already there, the city is able to achieve a 16 court complex for essentially the cost of building only eight dedicated courts. And as previously discussed, using some of the funds earmarked for pickleball to resurface the existing dual stripe tennis and basketball courts that conveys benefits beyond the pickleball community. It should be noted that the Bushmaster Park location for this project was not the choice of the pickleball community. It was the choice of Parks and Rec due to the cost efficiency of the project and the benefit to other sports. The pickleball's community first choice was a dedicated 16 court complex at Thorpe Park Annex for the following reasons. The northwest corner of the annex is large enough for a dedicated 16 court complex. It is already level and deforested which would minimize construction costs. Not a single tree would need to be cut. In addition, it's removed from homes. The closest home is over 300 feet away, twice the distance at Bushmaster Park. All other homes are farther away, as well as buffered by buildings on the property, thus minimizing any concerns regarding lights and sound. The petition that will be discussed next week was designed to give the council an option, something that some of you seem to be looking for. Thorpe Park Annex is an option, however, realize there will be pushback, um, and that needs to be factored into any decision. Flagstaff needs a 16-court pickleball complex somewhere, now. It was funded in last year's budget and slated to be finished this summer. Bushmaster Park or Thorpe Park Annex, the choice is yours. I encourage you to talk with Director Hagen, weigh all the pros and cons, make a decision, and allow Flagstaff to move forward with a plan that's best for the community Thank you, Jennifer. as a whole. All right, moving down to item number five, review of draft agenda for the July 3rd City Council meeting. Council, do you have any questions or comments about the agenda? All right, it is going to be a long one. All right, we're moving down to proclamations. The first is Community is Stronger Than Cancer Day. And if the representatives who are here for this proclamation could join us down here, that would be great. Council, I'll see you down there. Whereas there are more than 18 million people with a history of cancer living in the United States, 
and more than 5,200 individuals in the United States may be diagnosed with an invasive cancer in a single day in 2023 in 2022, excuse me, a 2016 report estimated that at least 2.8 million people provided care to a person with cancer in the United States in a given year. And those individuals spent an average of 32.9 hours a week providing that care. 41,120 new cancer diagnoses are estimated for 2023 in Arizona by the Arizona Cancer Society. Community is Stronger Than Cancer Day celebrates the community that comes together to support cancer patients, survivors, caregivers, and their loved ones. Community is Stronger Than Cancer Day was first celebrated in 2021 by 175 cancer support community and Gilda's Club locations across the country providing community-based support to patients, survivors, and caregivers who have experienced a cancer diagnosis. Community is Stronger Than Cancer Day will be celebrated by 190 locations in 2023. 228,779 people visited cancer support community adult programs in 2022 and 28,882 individuals participated in cancer support community, child, teen, and family programs, calling upon their communities for support, education, healthy lifestyle, and social events. 2,077 unique individuals participated in cancer support community Arizona programs in 2022. Now, therefore, I, Becky Daggett, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of Flagstaff, do hereby proclaim that June 28th, 2023, is to be known as Community is Stronger Than Cancer Day. My name is Cindy Payne, and I'm the executive director of Cancer Support Community here in Northern Arizona. Thank you so much for this proclamation. We exist here on North San Francisco Street to support all of those across Northern Arizona who are impacted in any way by any cancer, and all of our services are always free. The unfortunate news is that all of us are impacted by cancer. We all know someone. One out of every two men, one out of every three women over the course of their lifetime will receive a cancer diagnosis. Please send them to 914 North San Francisco Street so that they can take advantage of all of the free services that we offer. Thank you. All right, we have a few people in the back that I would like to ask to come down here and join us. That would be Parks and Recreation staff. Come on down. Okay, wonderful. Let's let these guys get by. And then we can see. Hello, Ken. Hi. I'm Becky Daggett. It's nice to meet you. Oh, you're going to fit. No. Just scoosh. Are we ready? 
Parks and Recreation is an integral part of the City of Flagstaff. Parks and Recreational opportunities are fundamental to creating, building, and maintaining a healthy, diverse, and enriching community through a variety of programs and activities. The Park Session maintains se section maintains 700 acres of park grounds, 59 miles of the urban trail system, the Citizens Cemetery services and operations, and snow operations to provide a safe and healthy community. The recreation section provides outdoor and indoor athletics, programming, and classes at a variety of recreational centers, which provides a livable community. The open space section maintains 3,500 acres of protected open spaces, creating passive recreation, wildlife education opportunities, which provides educational environmental stewardship. The events section manages 700 private events on city-owned properties, produces signature events, and markets the division's programming offerings for an inclusive and engaged community. Parks and Recreation begins with the children and youth of Flagstaff who are provided with a variety of enriching environments, educational opportunities, and physical programs, fostering their love for fun. Parks and Recreation continues into adulthood where community connections are established through indoor and outdoor athletics, events in our parks, and classes in our recreation facilities. Parks and Recreation supports our aging adult population with opportunities to maintain and improve physical health, enjoy passive recreation. Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Events Division of the City of Flagstaff dedicates this year's Parks and Recreation Month to one of the former Parks and Recreation Directors, Mr. Kenneth Ingalls. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Becky Daggett, Mayor of the City of Flagstaff, Arizona, do hereby proclaim July 2023 as, 2023 as Flagstaff Parks and Recreation Month in honor of Mr. Kenneth Ingalls. I would love to say a few words. I'm Rebecca Sayers. I have the honor of being the division director for this incredible group of folks. We have another one of our own sitting right here, and Nadine, you're welcome to join us, Nadine. Come on down. Come on down. Um, the family of Mr. Kenneth Ingalls, who is right here with us, thank you so much for being here today. You're an inspiration for me and all of us, and I guess I should put these on. Um, they provided a few words if I could share with you, and I, I'm sorry, I have to paraphrase a little bit. Um, but it is with great honor that we, the family of Kenneth Ingalls, get to introduce or reintroduce you to the Parks and Recreation Director from the years 1967 to 1988. It would be easy to list all of his accomplishments and what he's provided to the Flagstaff community. What's not as easy is showing the man behind such things. As he approaches his 85th birthday, we as a family have come upon a time of remembrance, appreciation, and gratitude. First and foremost, it would be a dishonor not to mention how grateful Ken is for the assistance throughout the city, including the city council, city managers, and the entire Parks and Recreation Department, and many others for helping Ken create and develop so many wonderful areas throughout Flagstaff. When assuming the directorship, Ken's initial goal for the city was to provide recreational spaces for low-income families. He was success successful in this by adding the Murdoch Center, the Hal Jensen Recreation Center, and the old St. Pius Church near Killip School. He, also, he is most proud of his work with developers, council members, and other city employees that supported projects to ensure the vision that every housing development had an open space and or park for that community. The list is long and beautiful. And I don't have time to read them all, but pretty much think about your favorite park near your neighborhood, and he had a hand in it. <laughs> it was Ken's goal and dream for every member of the Flagstaff community to have somewhere to go and recreate any month of the year, inside and outside. 
His great greatest memory of his times with Parks and Recreation was helping the people of Flagstaff create worthy use of leisure time. Even today, when you ask Ken what his goals are for the city, it is to continue to pro provide excellence in the field of Parks and Recreation. Ken knows Flagstaff and can share many memories, which I have here if you'd like to read them, of its history and its people as he watched it grow and change through his eyes. Even after his tenure with the city, Ken continued to fall in love with Northern Arizona and the community. His next career was with the Forest Service, and it's no surprise he began that career by working with the Youth Conservation Corps. He remained with the Forest Service until he retired just a few years ago. Ken Ingalls is a true legacy to Flagstaff, and we are honored to share his accomplishments, heart, and love for this community. Thank you, sir. And now, if I could scooch around, I do want to share just a few events that we have going on to celebrate Parks and Recreation Month for all of you. Okay, we are super excited to be celebrating our first Flag Forth Fest. This is coming up on Tuesday night. This is for all of you as well. It's weird that I have my back to you, but please join us. I don't know why these other things aren't going away. Um, at the Fort Tidehill Quad and Carnival area out um, south of town, the gates will be open at five o'clock. The laser light show is at nine o'clock. This is a first for us in this location, so we're excited to bring this to you. This is in partnership with Coconino County Parks and Rec, and we thought it'd be a perfect highlight for um, Parks and Recreation Month. Does anybody know how I can get this? Oh, <laughs> Tap the what? <laughs> There's more stuff about Ken in case you want to see it. Uh, we also have concerts in the park on Wednesday nights, a full moon, heart, full moon hike at Picture Canyon on Monday night, a, the Touch a Truck event um, out by our Hal Jensen Recreation Center, the ice cream social at Josie Montoya is always a huge hit, Dollar Days at the Aquaplex, and Jay Lively is open all month long. So thank you all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, for this recognition. And thank you for your patience with me.
Stacy, can you turn that microphone off? First of all, I would like to thank City Council for recognizing American Cancer Society. I am a victim, and I am be tr being treated very well, and cancer is a disease that we need to overcome with more research and development. Secondly, I would like to thank D D Darrell Cox, Daryl Cox and Christine Cox, my first two recreation hirees. <laughs> One worked at Marshall School, the other at Secret. Secret School for our summer recreation programs. I want to thank the City Council so much for co continuing support for Parks and Recreation. It is so necessary in our society. And I see some heads being shaken. Yes, it is. And continue that support. And people, make use of your facilities. And we need more. And we need to continue with the growth of the city. The city is growing in exponential growth. And I hope we can keep up with it. Do it. Recreation is worthy use of leisure time and continue. Thank you. I don't think we can ever top that proclamation. Uh, item number eight, city manager report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. It's been uh, a bit here, uh, uh, some time since uh, the last report. Uh, this report will include a couple of quick updates and then you'll have some monthly and quarterly updates and we'll start uh, that process with economic vitality and then we'll go to uh, water services, IT, and finish with pros uh, so we can give Rebecca and her team a little bit of a rest. Um, that was an excellent proclamation. Uh, on to my report, I uh, want to just take a moment and recognize a few individuals uh, who are called out in the report with some nice photos to accompany the narrative uh, in no particular order with our fire department uh, as the first one I want to touch on. Uh, the Commission on Professional Credentialing uh, voted to award Deputy Chief Mark Wilson the, fire, the Chief Fire Officer designation. Uh, he has earned this professional designation through uh, his demonstration of education, leadership, and management skills. Uh, Deputy Chief Wilson is one of 1,882 chief fire officers internationally. Uh, this is really cool. We're happy for him. Congratulations to Deputy Chief Wilson. Also, a hearty congratulations to Casey Gonzalez, uh, who has been promoted to fire captain. Congratulations, Casey. Um, moving on, I want to note in our Police Department Officer Reese Cleland uh, received a life-saving award uh, for responding to somebody who needed assistance, who was not breathing, and he was able to uh, bring this individual uh, back to um, uh, a state of well-being. And we thank you, Officer Cleland, for your life-saving efforts. Also, congratulations to Colette Truman with the police department for her promotion to uh, records manager. 
And one more congratulations to Melissa Say. See, say, see. Thank you. I always struggle with that one. I don't know why. Uh, Melissa C., uh, who was promoted to police sergeant. Well done, sergeant. Um, moving on, I did include a few photographs of the beautification efforts uh, downtown. If you haven't been downtown recently, check out the new planners and the alleyways. Um, they look really nice. Uh, thank you to all who were involved in getting those put into place. Uh, a lot of updates on meetings and events. Uh, I'm not going to cover them all. I will note um, that uh, we did recognize on May 25th uh, the well-earned retirement of Sergeant Todd Bishop with the police department. He's on his way to Alaska with his family. We're very happy for him and his family. Um, and of course, going back to May 31st, many of you attended the uh, groundbreaking for the Downtown Connection Center. It was wonderful. Um, thank you all who participated in that. I think with that, I will conclude my report, unless you have any questions of me, and turn it over to Heidi, who in under five minutes is going to give you an update from Economic Vitality. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, Heidi Hansen, Economic Vitality Director. Um, if you've ever seen my report, you know it is incredibly hard to do five minutes. So, ooh, what did I do to it? It's spinning. It will come back up. I don't have any jokes or anything while I'm doing it. Sorry. Okay. Up, it's updating. It's not on. Heidi, I'm the one who controls the time, so you don't have to worry about that. Thank you, Mayor. I mean, what I'm doing is important stuff, so. All right. Okay, first up is the airport, and I just wanted to let you know that, what is, okay, if it goes off, I'm gonna try to do my best. Um, the air service attraction, we're working on it. As the exit of United, we're working on trying to get air service again. We've had some really great conferences. Next month, I'll talk to you about Jumpstart Conference. Um, but for now, what we wanted to let you know is we did put in for the Small Community Air Service Development Grant. If we get that, it helps us to give an incentive to any airline that might want to come to Flagstaff. So we actually put, I believe, and Claire can always um, correct me, I think we asked for $750,000, which would go and help an airline to come to Flagstaff. If we receive that grant, we'll make sure that you all know about it so that you can talk about that in your travels as well. Um, also, the Flagstaff uh, hosted the Arizona Airport Association Spring Conference here. I'd like to thank our previous airport director, Barney Helmick, for getting them here. Um, and then thank you, Mayor Becky Daggett, for participating and, and providing the opening. And then Maria Robinson, our risk manager, also did a panel discussion. Moving on, we also have been working on the airport capital improvement projects. Uh, there are too many to name, and we've actually gotten FAA to secure a five-year plan yet again. And then our paid parking system, if you haven't been out to the airport, I think you'll be excited to see that in both parking lots, we will be having a paid parking system starting very shortly. We did say July 1st. We're thinking that that would be kind of crazy over the holiday and it's a Saturday so we're thinking more or less it's going to start probably around the 5th or the 6th of July. Don't worry we're going to bring you talking points and we'll make sure that you're well versed on the prices and everything like that. But we're going to get the system going and then we'll start generating some revenue for the airport and you'll find some parking. Our employments beat last May slightly which is good because of course we had United last May and this year we don't have United. So that means that people are really flying American and we appreciate that. In community investment, the Coconino Scroll that's out at the airport, I think you've seen that lovely project. We're still trying to fix the medallions and get those set, but you will see that there is a actual static installation there with some brochures that explains the story of Flagstaff. So if you're ever out there or you have people out there, please have them look at it. The Aspen Avenue Library entrance at the main library, our city manager gets to look at this beautiful project from his office every day and hear the construction. Um, it is almost complete. Jeremy DeGator is doing an excellent job in community development with this, and we are actually 
Very excited that it will be open at the end of the summer, sooner than the end of the summer. We're also working on Aspen bicycle and pedestrian enhancements. There are gonna be more to come. I'm not gonna to talk too much about the flowers because uh, City Manager Clifton did, but again, they're looking really good. We have put in traffic signal cabinets, uh, phase three. Dave McIntyre's team is doing an excellent job. I hope that you'll see some of those. One of my favorites is over by Fox Glen. Um, it's actually a fox and it is adorable. So anyway, a lot of them tell the story and history of Flagstaff, so if you haven't seen them, I hope you will. We also participated in Art X, the festival, and that uh, brought a lot of attention to arts and culture. And again, thank you, Mayor and others that attended. And then we took uh, the advice of our, our dear council member house who took our green book tour and we are actually working on property markers for that tour. So we'll be coming back to you very shortly about all of that. Moving into park flag, we did uh, spring cleaning in downtown along with the clean team from the DBA. We are working on South Side. Uh, residents and city staff walk the neighborhood and they discuss parking and non-parking issues with the South Side. And then our May revenues were up 14% and our permit sales were up 16%. And we're, we're not uh, trying to make a lot of uh, money on citations ever. That is the last thing we want to do. So we're just asking people to pay the kiosk. It's a dollar. I think when um, I ever leave this job, it's going to be somewhere that stated that Heidi said parking was a dollar. So just want you to know. And we go into business attraction. We were part of the Select USA conference where uh, Governor Dobbs was. And this is um, something that is about economic development and continuing to thrive in your community. And then we also had you all uh, continue to kick off our five business incentive programs. If anyone ever wants to know more about them, go to chooseflagstaff.com. And then we are uh, done phase one, thanks to Dave McIntyre and Jack Fitchett, our business attraction manager, for their great work on the business one-stop shop that started at the with the council, previous council. And you're gonna see more about that. But if you go to the website, city website, you're gonna see it's a lot easier to navigate for new business, for um, business that is already here and for, del for developers. And then phase two, we're gonna get even more um, quick on, on doing things. But right now, community development has some recruitment uh, that they're actually filling, and once that all gets put together, we're gonna get this one-stop shop finished. Once it's finished, we'll come back to a work session and go over it with all of you. Business retention expansion, we wanted to let you know chooseflagstaff.com is a very important website to us, so we did a redesign. I hope you go take a look at it. It's phenomenal. Thanks to John Saltonstall and his team. And then Innovate Waste Challenge, and I think some of you were part of that, happened in May, and we had uh, several businesses that pitched uh, for this Innovate Waste Challenge and several are receiving money, so thank you. And then we had Economic Development Week. We had several uh, things for our people to participate in and that went very well. I'm going on to the library. We actually had um, great library stats once again. And we just like to tell you that the amount of materials that were loaned out, if they had to actually purchase those in our community, it would be over $631,000. So I can tell you having it in a couple places in our community makes a lot of sense for the library. Our door count was up by 18%. People are using the library and they're coming through our doors. Our Wi-Fi use, use was up almost 42%. So again, we play a vital role in this community with those libraries. And then, just so you know, the library is gonna have a completely new website. It is much needed. And when that rolls out, we'll be sure to share with, with you. We also did a climate resilience work session, which was really helpful. It talked about the principles of fire safety and we actually had Neil Chapman come out and help share with a bunch of people, you know, about what to look for with wildland, wildland fire and precautions and things like that. So we think, thank our fire department for helping us with that. Sorry that I'm scrolling, it's probably getting you sick. Um, tourism, last but not least, May metrics are amazing. The last two months we were down slightly, but that's because the year before we knocked it out of the park so much that it's really hard to beat those numbers. But guess what, we beat them. May is crazy, we actually had occupancy at 77.1% and our ADR average daily rate and our RevPAR were actually all up as well. That means they were driving rate and they were filling rooms all at the same time. What a great combination. We had 15 print articles, 192 digital articles, 11 procured stories, and eight media assists from Discover Flagstaff in one month. Crazy. And then uh, Council Member Aslan, you'll love to hear this film. We had four inquiries. 
uh, for film permits. The word is getting out that the state has incentives and we get to participate in that. So we're seeing a lot more and we'll actually share more with you once those things get uh, produced. Great uh, stats with our Flagstaff Trails Passport that just, just started. So if you haven't been part of that passport, please go to discoverflagstaff.com, read about it. Our social was great, our sweepstakes were up. Uh, we went to IPW, and thank you, Councilmember Aslan, for joining the team. And I think he would probably tell you, uh, 82 appointments is ridiculous. And it was a long uh, you know, a session for all of our employees that went over there, but that means 82 different tour oper operators wanted to meet with Discover Flagstaff to bring their tour to Flagstaff. And I heard that we had countries that have never talked to us before that actually wanted to participate, so that's even more exciting. And again, Council Member Azen, you were there real time, you could probably speak to it more than I can. And then with our meetings, events, and conferences, we have an estimated impact of a million dollars with just three leads that went out last month. It's huge. Visitor services, uh, numbers were stable. I just wanted to again thank the mayor for being part of Flagstaff Train Day. We really appreciate your support. Uh, the indigenous art market started again, and we all are doing a call for artists. So if you know anybody that wants to participate in that art market at the visitor center, please let them know to reach out to Jessica Lawrence. I'm super excited about this NAU Sky Dome banner that is going to happen. Uh, taste that is lumberjack size, and it's about letting people know about our restaurants and our breweries. And just so you know, I wanted to say breweries, but they said we had to change it to brew pubs. So anyway, I know that we have breweries, but you got to do what you got to do. All right. And then last thing, but not, but last but not least, we have our fire awareness campaign in full out um, media everywhere. You can think of fire awareness. And we know that we've gone to stage one and we've gotten all the media out on that. We're definitely going to put something in the Arizona Republic. I mean, just so you know, Every visitor that pays attention to discoverflystaff.com should know that we are in stage one. So at any rate, if there's any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. And that, um, I, I'm sure I was over five minutes, sorry, Greg, but it is super hard. We've got a lot going on. Any questions? Thank you, Heidi. Vice Mayor. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, three questions. First is I want to know where I can get that burger on page 21. That burger, I think that was a Diablo burger was it? in okay. downtown. <clears throat> Good. Well, I'm glad I already know about that one. Um, second question, uh, Sherry. I, I don't know if you have Sherry any. Sherry Lamont. Yeah. It, do you want to um, give a shout out to her? Or? I would. Thank you for so much. Sherry Lamont, she is our travel international travel trade manager who is just retiring. And she her last day is Friday. And Meg Roeder, who is our community community communication specialist has uh, applied for that position and she's received it and she's actually cross training with Cherry right now and then we are revamping our marketing and media relations uh, program and we will uh, be hiring for, for something into that but Sherry has been with us for quite some time and she's had a 30 plus career um, in the tourism industry so she is going to be definitely missed. She Thank very you. much showed me a, a great time in San Antonio, Did and she? I just wanted to make sure that she got that call out. Uh, it, for, for me personally, Sherry, thank you for all that you've done for the city, and uh, I wish you all the best in your next endeavors, and very excited for Meg as well, uh, moving up into that role. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, we don't have to get into it. You can get into it as you desire. Um, I just want to give you a public shout out for paying very close attention and catching a uh, hot button concern um, with airport advertising uh, and, and just taking the initiative on that and, and getting those meetings going and getting that conversation rolling and making council aware of what's going on there. You can expound upon that if you want to. Um, don't feel compelled to. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to appreciate you uh, out loud for catching that um, and making that something that is being dealt with in a very proactive way as opposed to something that we're reacting to. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Councilman Aslan, I, I have to tell you, I work with a large team. Claire Harper, our communications manager, and Brian Gall, our airport director, they're the ones that brought it to my attention. Um, and so then I brought it to our city manager's attention and we brought it to our attorney. And so we're working on things. You know, everything with our marketing program is in its infancy. So, you know, we have to look at things and and we will uh, continue to adapt and do what's best for our program overall. So more to come. Got it. Any other questions, Council? Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate your support. 
Thank you, Heidi. I think next up, did, was it water services? Water services, thanks. Good afternoon, Lisa Dean, Water Services. It's been three months since we've been before you. Your report has a quarter between April and June. There's been a lot going on, and I invite you to read that report. Um, I'm, I will only touch on highlights. Our engineering department is very busy with lots of capital projects, both the bond-funded projects and uh, other projects in our capital plan. You hear about those regularly during normal council meetings, so I'm not going to talk much about them today. Uh, in red compliance, the annual water quality report, also known as the consumer confidence report, is out. It's posted on the website, and copies have been, physical paper copies have been mailed to every customer receiving a paper bill, and they've been had, received a notice of this report. There will be copies available at City Hall and at Water Services, uh, and also online for anyone that would like to review that report. Uh, in, also in red compliance, Lainey Stevens accepted the industrial pretreatment supervisor position, effective in May. Congrats, Lainey. It was well earned. Uh, one of our pretreatment inspectors, Kurt Novi, retired in May after serving the city for 16 years. So we have some nice long-term employees. It was time for him to retire, though. Stormwater, you hear about stormwater regularly, so I won't go into those projects. I will make note that the Flood Call Center is now live with Chase McLeod, who is our stormwater floodplain manager, heading that effort. Something new that's developed since this report was completed is the dredging on Francis Short Pond uh, is happening soon, working on the contracts and uh, it actually was going to be, is eligible for a uh, DEMA state reimbursement in emergency management. So we're very excited and we're hoping to get that done before August 2nd. On water production, uh, the big news we've had all quarter is Lake Mary has been overflowing, was overflowed, and uh, that really is a shot in the arm to our water supply. We're ramping up for surface water production and producing as much surface water as possible. It's our cheapest source and it offsets the groundwater use by quite a bit. Uh, the staff is also working on uh, tours for different groups. So where we regularly provide class tours, both elementary, uh, high school, and in, for NAU and the colleges um, on water uh, issues at both the water treatment plant and Wildcat Hill. Uh, I'll make a note that our very own Shannon Jones, our director, led a tour this last weekend to a group of students, high school students from up in Upward Bound program, which are high school students uh, at risk that are on a STEM NAU career path. So it was really nice to talk to those kids and hopefully we get some interest in uh, going into some of the water sciences and staying in Flagstaff. Uh, staying on water, we did kick off two studies, two evaluations to, comp to work in tandem with the Inner Basin Project, the larger femur project that is uh, underway. Uh, there is the, the lower IB pipeline does need a conditional assessment. It's, it's, uh, the pipe is old and it has leaks and the North Reservoir for Filtration Plant is undergoing a turbidity study. So we're hoping to complete those assessments and look at funding and how we can, can make that inner basin pipeline supply resource whole again by the time the inner basin uh, federal project is completed. In water distribution, their trucks, uh, service trucks is still a challenge. I think they're only down one, although they were up to three that they were down. We do have new trucks that are getting uh, service beds installed, and we're just hoping that they come sooner rather than later. Hydrant inspections, there's another up-to-date uh, 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 to this report. They have been completed. So there's 3,400 hydrants 
the the distribution crew inspects, repairs, and uh, takes care of every year, and they have completed that for this fiscal year. The distribution staff also removed stam bags from Stavon Away, installed a new muscle wall barrier to replace the tiger, tiger dams in preparation of the summer monsoon season. In water reclamation, uh, we'd like to offer congratulations to Troy Dagenhart, who accepted the position of water reclamation manager in, uh, in April of this year. He's very busy with projects. Spring is the time to do lots of repairs. And uh, aside from the larger capital projects, the gates and uh, the fiber trenching projects, anoxic mixers at both facilities, odor control units, and phone lines have been uh, projects that he's been that they've been working on. Uh, water resources has kicked off their water wastewater reclaimed weight rate study with a meeting on June second. Uh, this will be a 16-month process, so you'll be hearing about this for a while uh, as we work our way through looking at what our needs are uh, and what our reclaim, what our rates should be. So with that, I'm just going to ask if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Lisa. Council, do, we have, an, do we have any questions? Uh, thank you for that great update and I would just say that I've heard from a number of residents about Francis Short Pond and the concern about um, getting the dredging done so that water can be returned to it so thank you for getting on that yes okay. and thank you Lisa that was a wonderful update very exciting to hear about the uh, inner basin pipeline project as well uh, next, we have a quarterly update from Information Technology. Maybe we have a technological glitch. <laughs> Let's hear from our pros uh, division, and we might circle back to IT a bit later. Thank you. Clearly, I'm always happy to talk to you guys. Um, just find my presentation. Which looks like it got closed. Sorry. We'll go through this quickly because I know I've taken up a lot of your time today. But we have some great work going on. The Observatory Mesa Trail Plan um, is undergoing uh, its second round of public comment. We have a survey on the community forum site uh, through which you can access through the city's website, also on our Open Spaces page. Uh, so please participate and get your friends and neighbors to check it out and give us some feedback. Trail counters continue to be, uh, trails continue to be very popular. Of course, as we move into summer, they always ramp up. Um, so not a whole lot new to report here. Buffalo Park is still our uh, most commonly used uh, trail. You can see our open spaces are heavily used as well. Hopefully you all have seen our signs along trail. I'm just going to make this one bigger because it's funny. And very necessary. It's extremely necessary. We hear from this all the time. And we hear from the community that this is a problem. So come on, Flagstaff. Pick up after your dogs. And don't leave the bag on the side of the trail. That's just gross. Um, you want me to spend any more time on that? I could we, I could go on for quite a while, too. You, you want to just have a conversation about it? Maybe we should do that later. 
Uh, we are on the verge of getting some permanent restrooms installed at Thorpe Park near the playground. These are much needed and it will allow us to get rid of the um, portable restrooms. These are from the same type of installation we had out at Buffalo Park, although we didn't um, get quite as many of the beautification features as we have at Buffalo. But look for those coming, uh, literally swinging into place from a crane uh, in July or August, actually, I think the updated date is. Uh, out at Hal Jensen, we had our first ever mountain bike fix it or bicycle fix it clinic. This is um, kind of a pilot program that one of our employees is very passionate about bicycles and providing bicycles to those in need. And she arranged this uh, with some support and it was a great day. We can't wait to see what else uh, we're able to do with that. Uh, we also have lots of uh, summer fun programming at Hal Jensen Recreation Center. Here are a few things. I did want to point out that Monday through Friday we have meals for those 18 and under. All you have to do is show up and grab it. National Trails Day was June 3rd and we had some great volunteer events going on, uh, specifically out at the Schultz um, Creek Basin. So we have those new basins and we needed to reconnect some of those trails. And so with a lot of work with volunteers and forest service partners and our open spaces team, uh, among many others, I'm sure um, definitely stormwater was involved in this too, um, we are able to get this trail established so now it goes up and across one of those basins and then connects into the Forest Service uh, where that trail system begins. So many thanks to everyone doing that. As I mentioned earlier, we've got Flag Forth Fest coming up. This is a huge undertaking for our staff. I just wanna make sure that they are recognized for their hard work along with our partners at Coconino County and of course Discover Flagstaff is doing what they do best in helping us market it. So looking for a lot of fun out there. And um, some information on our analytics, our marketing program that we undertook in pros about a year ago is really taking off and our metrics are increasing thanks to our team working on that. And then continuing with what we started last month, these are all links to different activities going on, both privately held uh, that we permit and that we put on ourselves or in partnership um, with groups like the Flagstaff Downtown Business Alliance. Shout out to Terry. Um, so lots going on in and around town, especially in summer. We know it's busy. Um, this is our busiest time of year. We love it. Um, and thank you very much. I'll stop there. Thank you, Rebecca. You Do we have any questions or comments, staff? Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Um, just note how cool it is that we are having the Flag Forth Festival with what is looking to be an amazing laser show uh, right after hearing about uh, the city going into stage one fire restrictions. So coupling things together, um, the efforts by pros and many others to uh, orchestrate this laser light show uh, that will not be interrupted because of fire restrictions is just wonderful for this community. So um, I think uh, pros and the others who presented, I think we'll catch up on IT next time, if that's okay. Do you have any questions for me, Mayor or Council? Council? No, thank you. Thank you. All right, we're moving down to item number nine, post wildfire flooding update. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, so Ed Shanks, Stormwater Manager, we have a uh, rather large group here today to give you our monthly update on the post wildfire uh, flood projects and um, whatnot. Um, it'll be kind of a long talk today as we go into the flood season. 
So uh, to kind of give you the objectives, we'll go over the spruce wash updates, that's that museum fire area, the Shoals Creek updates, the pipeline fire area, um, inner basin and waterline road, uh, some of the monsoon preparations and so moving from preseason mitigation into flood response, and then open it up for discussion and questions. Uh, so starting in spruce wash, uh, the flood risk is still very real. You've heard about this back uh, this winter. We had the new uh, J.E. Fuller updated model that we presented, and uh, Julie Lee will walk through some of that again today. Uh, so even though the watershed has recovered uh, slightly, and even though we have had some capital improvement projects within the watershed, uh, we still see uh, through the flood modeling uh, a very real flood risk. Uh, this feasibility study 2.0, what we're also calling the Spruce Wash Watershed uh, Master Plan or, or Management Plan, uh, will be presented tonight, so Julie Lee will take lead on that. Uh, and it'll go over some of those bond-funded, yeah, I know, lead and lead, uh, go over some of those bond-funded projects, while Eli Reisner, as well as Eagle Mountain, uh, provide some details on that. So the eight projects that we have under uh, Proposition 441. Uh, that will reduce the immediate flood risk um, for those in the, the Paradise, Grandview, and Sunnyside uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and we should also mention that while we're showing this, uh, everything we've been talking about is that two inch and 45 minute storm. So that's kind of the design storm we've been using as kind of emergency mitigation. Uh, and just as a quick reminder, that that is not our typical design storm in the city or in the county. So that is uh, typically a 25-year event, so a 4% annual exceedance probability storm. Uh, at some point, we will have to move over to a FEMA standard, and that's a 1% storm, so a 100-year storm. So um, I know there have been some questions out there and some concerns uh, that spruce wash is improving, and maybe we don't need some of these projects. Uh, and just to give you kind of a little bit of a forewarning, uh, we're still in the emergency response stage here. At some point in the future, we will have to move over to the typical FEMA special flood hazard uh, area analysis, which is that 1% storm. So at some point in the future, we will be switching some of these maps over. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie, and then we'll have a whole suite of, of amazing presenters after this. Thank you. Take lead on this one. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council. You are probably very familiar with this suite of projects. We've been up here a few times, so we've also presented the same suite of projects in a community meeting. Um, so just as a quick reminder, projects one through seven are part of the proposition. Um, project number eight, which is the Killip Basin Inlet, that was constructed last year in partnership with FUSD. And then project nine is the Parkway Basins project, which is complete um, as of uh, just a few days ago, I believe. And that was funded um, through the Flood Control District and NRCS funding. So the final feasibility study is complete, yay. Um, it's been a huge work in process, but that feasibility study has really been guiding the development of the suite of projects and informing what the, the concept design will look like. So first, I want to start with existing conditions, just as a reminder. So existing conditions, this is, um, these are the maps that we've shared with the community. These are available online for anybody to look at that would like to. This is the two inch, 45 minute storm event. So as Ed said, this is about a 25 year event. So I'm gonna show the south half and then I'm gonna show the north half. And then I want to talk through what the impacts are starting at the downstream end and working our way upstream. Um, but you see in this existing conditions mapping, um, the exhibit, the anticipated flood depths for that storm, for that two inch 45 minute storm event. You see a lot of blue, you see a lot of green. That lighter blue is up to a half a foot in depth. That darker blue is up to one foot of in depth. And then we see the greens which increase in that depth. And this is, this is kind of what we saw in 2021, what we experienced and what the neighborhood experienced. Um, and then you see at the, the bottom part, you can see the, the Killip detention basin. So those are in this model. This is the updated model from J.E. Fuller. So when I talk about the updated model, this is um, recognizing the work that the flood control district performed on forest. This is construction of those alluvial fans um, that happened upstream last summer. Um, 
This also includes fieldwork in November that the J.E. Fuller team conducted that looked at how much recovery have we seen on forest. So they looked at tree canopy, what the slopes are, how much um, organic material is, is on the ground, um, and factored all of that into this existing conditions model and calibrated it against the data that we have regarding precipitation events for the last couple summers. So this is um, up-to-date mapping. Okay. All right. So as we move north, cedar is on the bottom part of the screen there. So this is the same color coding, but again, existing conditions, just a bit of a reminder. We see significant impacts on Grandview Drive. Um, you can see upwards of two feet in front of people's homes on Grandview Drive. And then you do see behind Grandview Drive in the, um, the drainage and utility easement where um, Ed was talking about the FEMA floodplain, you can see that those depths in the wash behind the homes and upstream. So there still is significant risk. Um, and again, this is, this is the type of storm event we could possibly see during monsoon season. So let's see here. Now what I wanna show you is how things start to dry up as we say, well, what happens once the suite of projects is constructed? How do these things dry up and how does this look? So again, I'm gonna start on the, on the downstream end. So you can see the Killet Basin, there's your frame of reference. Now, if you start to look at this exhibit, you'll see a lot of that blue is disappearing around the homes, around Dortha Avenue, for example, and you're seeing quite a bit more flow in the channel that's behind the home. So spruce wash, spruce wash proper from Cedar all the way down to Arroyo Seco. So this all starts with the Killip Regional Detention Basin. That's where, and I, I know we've talked about this before a little bit, but how much water can we send to kill a regional detention basin, that investment that you made? Well, we've figured that out. <laughs> it's been a lot of work, but we've figured it out. And we can send about 340 CFS to the Killip Regional Detention Basin. So from that point, we're gonna march our way upstream. Um, so there's still quite a bit of flow that goes through the pipe, and then we have an amount of flow that, that goes to Killip Basin. And the reason why we say it's about 340 CFS is that we can't send more water than that. Otherwise, we start to see a negative impact downstream. Where, let's say, if we were to send more than that, then we would see, we could start seeing inundation and flooding downstream where it doesn't currently exist today. And that's unacceptable um, to create flooding where it doesn't exist today for residents. So that's our threshold, and that's, what, that's what's driving that flow. So now we're gonna march our way back upstream. This portion here, Dortha, that was the box culvert that was constructed last year, and then you can see the channel between Dortha and Cedar right here at the top. You can see most of that flow is contained in that channel that was constructed last year, so that's great. Okay, so as we move north, if you remember the last, um, the existing conditions, there was a lot of green on Grandview Drive. A lot of two foot flood depths, maybe even higher on Grandview. Now what you see is a lot of blue and it's generally contained, for the most part, within the roadway prism. So this is a critical point in the, um, we have about 1,100 cubic feet per second coming to just upstream of this crossing on Linda Vista. And this is where we, we have to figure out how much can we send to the wedge, how much can we send down Grand Grandview, and then how much do we need to send down Spruce Wash. So what we've done, let's start with the wedge. So with the wedge here, we can send about 15 to 20% of that flow. So about 200 CFS we can send to the wedge 
if we send more down to the wedge, it starts to overtop and it's back to that same issue that we that I mentioned earlier about Killet Basin where then we start seeing flooding downstream that didn't exist before. So that's what we know. So we've maxed that out. We can send about 20%, not quite 20% to the wedge. And then we say, well, how much can we send down Grandview with the, with the inverted crown through here before we start having an issue at Main Street and sending more water to folks on Main Street and Sunnyside than what they experienced before? That's about that same amount, just about 20%. So about 200 CFS is what we, we can plan to send down Grandview. So that leaves about 700 of it going down the channel behind the homes here. Um, and, and this is feasibility level, so this is accurate. This is a general guide. It may not be precise. So when I say 700, it could end up being 706 or 692. Um, just keep that in mind, you know, kind of um, rounding a little bit um, just to be the general guide. So this modeling will be conducted at every design phase. So we, we completed the modeling for the feasibility study. We're gonna do it again for 30% to check in. We're gonna do it again at 60%. We're gonna do it again at 100%. We're gonna do it again after everything's constructed. This is a work in progress. But it gives you a sense of, of where we're headed. And it's, it's really exciting. We're starting to see the benefit of the investment that, that voters and that the community is making um, to help ease the pain of flooding for the folks in the Grandview and Sunnyside neighborhoods. Um, we intend to release this feasibility study. Sarah and her team are working on a, a press release. So we will be sharing this. Um, this is the first time we've, we've shared it publicly. We're sharing it with you first, Council. Um, and then we're going to share it with the community. So these will be posted to the website. That newsletter will go out. Um, and then I'm sure we'll, we'll be meeting with residents and, and fielding calls and also focusing on a, a public meeting towards the end of summer as we, as we move forward. Um, so that's a general presentation on feasibility too. Eli is going to walk through the details of each one of those projects. I'm happy to turn it over to Eli now, but if you have questions, I can, I can pause here, Mayor, if you'd like. Any, uh, Council Member Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm just trying to connect the dots, and I don't know if Ed will want to answer this or you, but um, you know, we talk a lot about climate change, and we're seeing more flooding than we've ever seen before, right? So um, we're building all these new stormwater infrastructure based on a 25-year flood event, correct? And Two years ago, maybe it was three, we had, what, two 100-year flood events and a 500-year flood event, I think, up Spruce Wash. So can you just walk me through, like, why did we just pick a 25-year flood event when we're already predicting that um, our seasons will get bigger, the flooding storms will get bigger, um, and yet we're investing a lot of money into just a 25-year flood event. So can you just address that for me? Do you, do you want, yeah. I, I Go for it. Address that I knew one. Ed would want to come up here. <laughs> yeah, it's probably more my responsibility on that one. Great question, by the way. Um, so we do know that the watershed is um, recovering with time. So when we look at the two inch and 45 minute storm event, when I say we're, we're using that as our emergency guide, that's really what we're using for the first five or 10 years with the understanding that uh, over time that watershed will continue to heal. It'll probably, in our lifetimes, it's never gonna look like it did before 2019. We, we know that. I mean, you can look at the 1977 radio fire on, on Mount Eldon, you can look around the West, um, but, but there will be recovery. So at some point there will be uh, a less of a flood risk due to the watershed improving, uh, whatever that forest looks like. It might be oak, you know, it might be scrubland, but uh, whatever that might look like, it's gonna be better than what we see today. Um, so that's, that's one answer. Uh, the other answer um, is just feasibility. So if we're to take a look at that one inch, or I'm sorry, that 1% storm, that 100 year storm, right now, you know, year four or five after the fire, um, that, that discharge, that cubic feet per second is so large that it's not feasible to design to that. Essentially, you, we would have to remove homes. We would have to have a very large 
LA River style concrete channel. And, and that's just not, if one, it's not feasible, and two, it's not the right answer for the community because you're gonna be developing something, going back to my first statement, um, that we're not gonna need as that watershed recovers. So it's a moving target, um, but we, we do think with the science and what we've seen through the flood control district here in Coconino County, as well as uh, throughout Arizona, that that two inch and 45 minute storm is the appropriate storm to be looking at in terms of discharges um, or flow uh, for the, the near term. But it's a great question, uh, and, and obviously it is a moving target, not just for us, but uh, across the country. Um, there's been some really interesting studies coming out of, you know, changing climate, changing precipitation trends, and uh, the flood risks that come with it. So uh, we're sitting on top of that, and I think we're, I'm pretty confident that what we're designing here through feasibilities two, as we call it, um, it really is probably the best, if you will, bang for the buck. We're, we're really compromising and finding the, the central ground of pr producing a long-term flood mitigation strategy uh, while also, uh, you know, not um, adversely impacting the neighbors um, too badly, if you will. Just one more follow-up. So some of the stormwater drains that we have now, refresh my memory, I think they were built for like a 10-year flood event. Is that correct? Am I correct in that? Uh, we have a whole range, yes. Yeah. So uh, some of the older uh, stormwater catchments and stormwater systems are, are designed to a 10-year um, flow event. And, and again, I say a whole range because um, our understanding of precipitation and flood flow has changed as well. So if you're taking a look at a snapshot in time, the drainage design manual that uh, Stormwater put out or community development before that uh, has also changed. So what we're using for rainfall runoff for example, what we're using for rainfall, what we're using for runoff, all of those different components change. So for rainfall, for example, you know, we're using Atlas 14 right now, it's a NOAA product. Um, you know, I was just talking with Brian Klamowski earlier, you know, there's, it's very interesting, there's a lot of science going on whether Atlas 14 is the most correct uh, precipitation uh, recurrence interval that we need, and, and most likely it's not. We'll have an Atlas 15 at some point. There's been 14 iterations at least. Uh, and same thing with runoff. I mean, we're using Bolton 17C. It's a, it's a runoff coefficient that the Army Corps just uh, made public. Well, it's been public for a while, but it's official as of two years ago. So my point is, without going into the technical details, the science is evolving. It's very fast moving. Uh, it's very exciting, but also that's very frustrating because it's very exciting. This is not a, not a field where you want to be exciting. You you want to be uh, as steady as possible. Maybe my last maybe my last question. Um, you said in in the beginning in your presentation that there may come a time where we have to go to the FEMA one inch. Can you expand on that? I mean, what what did you mean by that? Like, so so at the moment we have a, a FEMA so. We have FEMA floodplains and floodways throughout the city, and that, those are what we call the special flood hazard areas. Um, so those are mapped uh, routinely. They try to do an update every 10 years. Most of those updates are, are pretty minor just because uh, a major update is, is expensive and, and quite time consuming. Um, so we were, were running off of the flood insurance study map, so FIS map for 2010. Uh, there has been an update for 2020, at the co and this is at a county level. Uh, again, most of that is, is very small nuance changes. What we have to do as the floodplain administrators, so we are, the stormwater section is the floodplain administrator for the city of Flagstaff. Uh, Coconino County Community Development is the floodplain administrator for Coconino County. So we are the local representatives for FEMA. What we have to do is submit what's called a letter of map revision, so it's a LOMAR, whenever we know that there is a large substantial change to a floodway or floodplain. Um, we've been kind of given a grace period, if you will, for all this post-wildfire projects and, and flood areas, uh, just under the understanding that we do have a very quickly changing watershed. Um, so we have not produced a LOMAR for any of the work that we've done so far in this area. Um, but in the near future, we will have to address that with FEMA. So in the future, we will have to uh, produce a new FEMA map um, for all these post-wildfire flooding areas. And unfortunately what that means is if we have a new floodplain or a new floodway, all the FEMA restrictions that go along with that will come along with it. So that's develop development restrictions to some level, whether it's a floodplain or floodway, makes that determination. Um, and then also 
the mandatory flood insurance for anybody who has a mortgage within it. So um, we are really pushing hard to do the most good we can now while we still have that grace period. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. I'm Eli Reisner, City of Flagstaff Capital Improvements Project Manager, and I'm the Project Manager for the Spruce Wash Flood Mitigation Suite of Projects. Um, today I'll be going over uh, the suite of projects, milestones for the projects, and upcoming construction contract award, and then I'll be turning it over to the uh, Flood Control Dist District for their update. Um, I did also want to just point out uh, for these projects, we are in the very early stages of design and there are still a lot of unknowns regarding the design of these projects. Um, we are currently working on analyzing a lot of the survey data of the existing conditions that will help inform the design as we progress on these projects. Uh, so my review of these projects today will be at a very high level of the projects. Um, so I just wanted to point that out before we get started. Um, so the first project on the list is the Grandview Drive reconstruction project. Uh, this project is located on Grandview from Linda Vista Drive to Cedar Avenue. Um, and these proposed improvements generally consist of the existing, of, of reconstructing the existing roadway, curb and gutter, water and sewer infrastructure. Um, just to kind of look at some of the existing conditions. Uh, the roadway is currently crowned at the center line um, and as well as there is currently a road curb along the entire roadway which has a very minimal stormwater capacity for the roadway. Um, so again, what we are proposing for this project is reconstructing the roadway with an inverted crown and vertical, vertical curb that will increase the stormwater capacity for the roadway. By inverting and lowering the roadway, that will require replacement of the aged water and sewer infrastructure. And those improvements will include replacing the water and sewer mains, water and sewer services, um, and replacing those services out to the back of curb. Uh, these improvements will also include um, improvements to the same improvements to the cul-de-sacs along this section of Grandview. The next project is the wedge detention basin. This project is located in the wedge-shaped city-owned parcel just west of the Cedar Safeway. Proposed improvements for this project include underground storm drain and construction of a large detention basin with the goal for this project to take a portion of the water from the Spruce Wash and Linda Vista Crossing and divert those, those waters to the basin. The red line and triangle depicts uh, a general location for the storm drain pipe and the catch pit or and the detention basin, but the detention basin will likely be constructed in the lower southeast portion of the wedge parcel. The next project is number three on the list, the Linda Vista Drive crossing project. This project is located on Linda Vista Drive between Paradise Road and Adrian Way. Uh, proposed improvements for this project generally consist of replacing the existing storm drain pipes with bigger box culvert, uh, adding an inlet for the wedge, and some channel regrading upstream within the public utility easement and drainage easement. These improvements will increase the inlet capacity to keep and send more water down the channel and spread a portion of the flows to the wedge. This will reduce but not eliminate the potential for overtopping at Linda Vista Drive. The next project on the list, number four, Cedar Avenue to Linda Vista Drive channel. This is the section of channel from Cedar Avenue to Linda Vista Drive that is between Grandview Drive and Monta Vista Drive. Proposed improvements with this project generally consist of regrading and most likely hardening the channel with shotcrete and or concrete. Hardening is needed to prevent erosion by the large volume and velocity of water expected in the channel. These, these improvements will increase the channel's capacity and conveyance this is the area that a lot of data collection has been taking place. We are currently processing this data and will be for the next month and that information will help dictate the design of the improvements. 
The next project on the list is number five, the Cedar Avenue crossing. This project is located on Cedar Avenue between Monta Vista Drive and Grandview Drive. These proposed improvements generally consist of replacing the existing box culvert with a bigger box culvert and lowering the channel flow line. These improvements will increase the inlet capacity and send more water down the channel. The next project is number six, the Royal Seco Drive to Dortha Avenue channel. This is the section of channel from Arroyo Seco Drive to Dortha Avenue between First Street and Rose Street. This is the next section downstream of the completed Cedar Avenue Dortha, Cedar Avenue to Dortha Avenue project. This section is a little different from the previous uh, section that is north of Cedar in that it has an existing six inch storm drain pipe underneath the open channel. Proposed improvements for this project generally consist of regrading and most likely, again, hardening the channel with shotcrete under concrete. Uh, these improvements will again increase the channel's capacity and conveyance. The next project is number seven, Arroyo Seco Drive Inlet. And this project is located just north of the Arroyo Seco townhomes and to the north and the northeast corner of the Ponderosa Park. Proposed improvements for this project generally consist of reconstructing the existing inlet structure, which will increase the inlet capacity to capture more water into the existing underground 60-inch CMP. The next project, number eight on the list, Killip, the Killip Basin Inlet Project, located just west of the Royal Seco Inlet at the northeast corner of Ponderosa Park. This is an Army Corps of Engineers funded project, which is different from the, suite of pro the seven suite of projects um, funding source. Um, these pr uh, proposed improvements generally consist of an inlet structure to connect the flows from the spruce wash to the Killip detention basins. These improvements will, will provide a controlled flow across Ponderosa Park into the detention basins when the Royal Seco Inlet is at capacity. I wanted to touch on some of the milestones for the project. Um, on July 3rd, under the consent agenda, council will consider the award for the construction manager at risk CMAR construction services agreement for a guaranteed maximum price or GMP of $2.9 million to Eagle Mountain Construction for the Grandview utilities and wedge clearing portion of this suite of projects. The construction of the Grandview Utilities will be the first scope of work constructed out of this suite of projects and will begin following this year's monsoon season. In August, the preliminary modeling will be complete for the suite of projects, at which point we will schedule a public meeting to show preliminary designs and the benefits of these improvements to the community. In December, final plans are due for the entire suite of projects. In February of next year, we will be recommending Council's award of the remaining projects to the CMAR Construction Services Agreement with Eagle Mountain Construction. In the spring of next year, construction will continue on a select few projects from the suite of projects. The order in which these projects will be constructed is still unknown at this time, and we will be terming this as design progresses, and as material lead times are determined, and as we coordinate with similarly timed uh, projects in the surrounding area. Again, we are targeting completion of these projects in fall of 2025. GMP number one includes the Grandview Utilities, the Wedge Clearing, Eagle Mountain Construction, remaining design phase services, and Beta PR public outreach services. The underground utilities portion of the Grandview project generally consist of replacing and lower the existing underground water and sewer infrastructure prior to the construction of the inverted crown and the vertical curbs on Grandview. As depicted in this image, the clearing of the wedge project will consist of removing trees in the footprint of the detention basin for the wedge project. This cleared area will be prepared and used as a temporary construction yard for the suite of projects prior to the excavation of the detention basin.
The GMP also includes the remaining design phase services for Eagle Mountain Construction to assist with constructability review, cost estimates, scheduling, and sequencing of the projects. Beta PER public outreach services are also included in the GMP to assist with community meetings, mailers, website updates, and weekly construction updates to the community. Staff will be recommending award to Eagle Mount Construction who is selected through a qualifications based uh, process. Again, this was the first GMP for the spruce wash flood mitigation suite of projects. The remaining projects will be, re will be presented for council's consideration in early 2024 with a second GMP added as, added as an amendment to the original agreement. Again, this GMP will be on the July 3rd council meeting under the consent agenda for council's consideration. I'll take a minute to pause there and see if the council has any questions before I turn it over to the flood district for their update. Council, any questions? I do. Vice Mayor? Just real quickly, Julie knows I've talked about this before. The detention basin and the wedge I uh, just want to make sure we're, we're still talking about a buffer of trees uh, surrounding it uh, just for aesthetic purposes. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, yes, that is the intent. Um, we're, you can see that buffer, the outline, um, looking at that buffer along the slip lane or the piece of Linda Vista that connects to Cedar Avenue. We are hoping we might be able to keep a buffer of trees also along Cedar Avenue. Um, we're in the middle of doing the detailed on the ground survey and processing that. So what we wanted to do here is we're starting with a footprint that um, we wanted to be a little bit conservative and keep it in a little bit tight. Um, just since we're not at final design yet, you know, we may need to expand out a little bit but this is the, the starting point and we think it's pretty close. But I know that's important to you. Yeah, wonderful. Just wanted to give voice to that. I know you'll do the best you can. Uh, functionality obviously is paramount, um, but to the extent that this can be taken care of and uh, protected um, from view, let's go ahead and, and try what we can. Appreciate it. You bet. Councilmember Harris. Yes, I know that you all have thought of this, but I got oh, excuse me, I have to ask it anyway. The kill up um, retention thing, is there something around it? You know, like a fence, fence or fencing? yes, or something. And you're talking about the kill up retention basin? Yeah. Yes, yes, there is fencing around it. Um, I'm just thinking when I drove by along Sixth Street, there is. I, I'm not sure about the, the north and eastern portion of it. I believe we are currently in the process of putting up some temporary fencing on, nor on the north side, um, but I do not know for sure on the east side next to the school. Um, I don't know if anybody else, okay. Ed or Julie, if you guys know anything about that. Um, or Sam, there is? Okay, thanks. I still be all right telling us that there is. So. so the idea is to put some kind of protective thing around it or um, something. For, are you talking about for the wedge now? No, I'm talking about the basin that's over by the school. Yeah, so there is already, it sounds like there is uh, fencing around the perimeter. Oh, okay. Already. All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. On the Grandview construction, um, what will that, that process look like and how will residents access their homes? Right, so this will be very similar to what we've been doing in the Coconino States Improvements Projects. Um, we'll be coming in, doing all the utility improvements first. Um, Eagle Mountain Construction has done a very good job in the Coconino States Improvements Projects for me for helping to coordinate access for property owners, either providing plates, um, talking with them about when they're gonna be out for the day, um, and kind of organizing the work in such a way that they're maintaining access during the construction of the project, as well as maintaining water and, uh, water and sewer services throughout the construction of the project, with the exception of minor service interruptions, we go to tie in those services and mains. So. And my apologies if I missed, if you said this and I missed it, what is the estimated um, end of construction or completion of construction for just that portion? 
for just the Grand View utility portions? We're looking at completion. Gra the whole Grand View um, road construction. So, so right now we only know about the Grand View utilities portion. Um, the roadway section will be done at a later date, and we just don't know the scheduling and sequencing of the remainder of the projects. Right now, all we know is that we will be constructing the Grandview Utilities portion first in, in, I guess, in anticipation of doing those roadway construction improvements. And the Grandview Utility improvements, we're looking to have those done uh, likely in the springtime of next year. Again, pending weather, um, any, any delays to weather that we have for that, so. And uh, you'll be installing a curb, so no sidewalk, but just the curb? Correct, yeah. And what will the construction from Linda Vista to the wedge look like? Will it be in phases? How much will be torn up? Um, we haven't put a whole lot of thought into that yet. Again, we don't know the, the sequencing of that of that project, um, again, in the very early stages of design here, um, and we don't even have a current alignment for that uh, corrugated metal, or for that storm drain pipe that'll go from uh, the Linda Vista crossing all the way down to the wedge, so that'll still be determined. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, Council Member Harris, then Council Member McCarthy. Okay, so for Grandview, you said that you're not putting in sidewalks. How can you do a curb and not a sidewalk? So the sidewalk typically sits behind the curb. Um, but yeah, that is correct. We will not. We are not looking at, or we will not be. We have looked and considered sidewalks for the project, um, but we will not be constructing sidewalks for the project along Grandview. Okay, I'm gonna have to figure that out because I can't see it in my mind how you could put a curb in, but no sidewalk, because I thought gotcha. curbs kind of connect to a sidewalk. So maybe I can back up to a picture here that might help out with that. So our curbs, um, so our curbs are out here next to the, next to the asphalt edge, and typically you'll see your sidewalk back here behind the curb, um, but that is something that we are not constructing with this project, is the sidewalks. Um, and Julie, I don't know if you want to hop in on a question as to why we're not constructing sidewalks with this project. It's um, post wildfire flood remediation. It's post wildfire flood remediation, um, and that's the the scope of work, and so that's the focus of the work. And sidewalks do not currently exist out there today. Councilmember McCarthy. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Two questions. Uh, concerning that slide that's up there right now, you're showing that the center of the street will be lower. Will the area just inside the curb be lower than it is now to add a little more capacity? Correct, yes. Good, like be six roll, inches lower or yeah, so? The roll curb is typically around four inches high, and the vertical is about six. So we'll be actually be dropping that edge of pavement by around, I don't know, two to three inches um, for the curb there, and then as well as inverting the, the crown to add more capacity for the roadway. All right, that makes sense. Uh, my last question is concerning the wedge. Um, when it overfills, uh, will there be a spillway, and what will it, will it just spill out onto the street, or will it go somewhere um, right now, and Julie, correct me if I'm wrong here, but right now our plan is to have a connection point into the existing storm drain infrastructure that's a long cedar for that wedge to slowly um, drain the water out of. And I don't know if Julie, if you want to add any more to that. <laughs> we have to shut the valve, so to speak. So there's going to come a point when that basin is full and we have to stop flow from going to that basin. And that is something that we're working on right now, what that valve is going to look like or how we're going to control that and shut it off. We were hoping that we could just control it through pipes and you know placement of pipes, um, but that's, that's not likely to work. So we'll have probably a very large gate valve um, close to, to Linda Vista to be able to control that. So once it's full, Normal, no more water goes into it. Otherwise, it will overflow. 
and that would be a, uh, not a, that would be an unacceptable situation. All right, it looks like that's it in terms of questions. All right, so I think up next is for Flood Control District yeah. or Julie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Sean Golightly wanted to be here. He's actually presenting to the Board of Supervisors right now. Um, so he asked me if I could talk to you a little bit about what the Flood Control District is doing. So, um, you know, I do a lot of work with the City of Flagstaff, but I do a lot of work for the Flood Control District and I support the Flood Control District in the technical administration of, of some of their projects. So I'm, I'm gonna put on my FCD hat here for a moment. All right, so let's start with the parkway sediment basins. Basin number one is complete. Um, so to get you oriented here, this is Linda Vista on the right-hand side of your screen. And this, this road right here is parkway, hence the parkway basin project. <laughs> this is basin one. This is the one that's um, lowest in elevation. So spruce wash flows from the upstream side on the left um, down to Linda Vista here. So that first basin is complete, and the intent is to construct two more sediment basins immediately upstream of that. Um, if you recall the Flood Control District presented earlier this year um, about the reasoning and justification for doing the single basin had to do with schedule and procurement and funding. Um, so it was, it was fantastic that we got that first basin to work, and um, we hope to, to see the benefits of that this year. And there's a, a photo of what that looks like. Okay, so now I'm going to move over to the pipeline fire. Um, so this is an update on the Schultz Creek on forest work. And there are two phases to the Schultz Creek on forest work. And this, the first phase is immediately upstream of the city's basins, the new Schultz Creek basins that were completed um, in October of last year. So immediately upstream, phase one includes, includes a newer strategy for the Flood Control District and Natural Channel Design and Forest Service, and it's a plug and spread. So the plug and spread, um, and when, when this PowerPoint was put together, it was about 50% complete, but I think they're actually planning to wrap up this work this week. Um, they've been moving, Tiffany Construction's been moving very quickly, um, trying to get out of there before monsoons begin. Plug and spread, it, spread is um, part stabilization of the channel, but it's a way of, and it works in our favor in this location with topography. Think of um, some uh, large rock, um, shallow check dams that that are um, in a series in that channel. What that does is it slows down the water, allows it to spread out, it drops out the sediment, some of the sediment that's carrying from upstream, and then it also helps with scouring and sourcing more sediment as it's moving downstream. Um, this is a great strategy because it's less tree removal. You know, they're just working in these, um, these slivers essentially in the channel, working their way up and um, keeping the, the vegetation and the, and the trees in place to do that. Um, so again, that work is almost complete. The intent of that is sediment and debris reduction. Um, Sean Golightly has been working with uh, local media. This is a really popular area. Um, so he's been communicating, um, working with the Forest Service as well. Now phase two is further upstream. Phase two will start after monsoon season. Um, the reason that one's lagged a little bit is that um, NEPA funding, or excuse me, NEPA clearance needs to happen before that work can start. So that's underway in partnership with the Forest Service, and that's mostly um, grade control. That will happen in phase two in the future. And the intent is that work will be complete before monsoons of 2024. All right, I think I'll let um, Ed speak to the county's public works projects. Unless anybody speaks up for county public works, I guess I'll take it. Um, so uh, Mount Eldon Lookout Road is a county public works project at roughly 1.85 million 
uh, they were able to bond fund that. Um, Banneke Construction is their uh, contractor for it. So if you've been up there near the Schultz Y or Schultz Pass, you'll see their, their work ongoing. Uh, they do have traffic modifications expected throughout this summer uh, with Banneke working uh, six days a week at 10 hours each, uh, hoping to get this completed before September if possible. Uh, the purpose of this project is to upsize uh, the culvert at uh, Eldon Lookout Road um, for Schultz Creek, so it would allow uh, for fewer um, overtopping. If you were out there last year, it was overtopped quite a bit. So uh, hopefully we'll have a long-term um, project in place there to allow the road to be fully functional and then also prevent scour downstream on that um, Kinder Morgan pipeline, that high-pressure gas pipeline that's immediately downstream. So work is ongoing there, uh, very busy. If you've been up in that area, we have quite a bit of work between uh, what Julie just presented for the plug and spread, Inner Basin, which uh, Stacy will be speaking to briefly, or soon, I should say, uh, maybe not briefly, hopefully not briefly, and uh, also Eldon Lookout Road. So a lot of projects going on in the upper Schultz Creek uh, area. And with that, I'll move down into the city portion of Schultz Creek uh, and get some project updates there. So immediately downstream of the county's project is uh, the city's Schultz Creek Channel Stabilization Project. You've heard about this in our last couple uh, discussions. Uh, this is uh, funded uh, to 75% by the NRCS EWP grant. Uh, and new news, uh, the 25% uh, the local match is now being matched by DFFM. So we're getting that matched uh, by the state. So a real big win here. Uh, really what we uh, have to pay for out of the city is mostly design, so um, a ra rather small portion of the entire project. Uh, again, that goal is to stabilize the channel between our Schultz Basins and Highway 180, and uh, we're hoping to see a lot of improvements there so that we have less sediment and debris entering our stormwater system downstream. Uh, again, this is a rather quick project with most of our ERD, EWP, sorry, most of our EWP grants. Uh, these are 220-day projects, so we do have to get this completed by October. Uh, so moving quickly with our designer natural channel design uh, to get us a 60% design. Actually, I just noticed on my phone I got that uh, about 10 minutes ago. Um, so we'll be working uh, through the review of that design, and then if it is uh, um, substantially complete, we will put that out. Uh, for procurement for the construction phase. Uh, moving downstream from there, uh, very exciting. If you've been on Highway 180, uh, you'll notice all the work going on there. So this is the ADOT uh, project. This is the emergency short-term mitigation project. Uh, so replacing in kind their 48-inch pipe that goes uh, near firehouse number five, and then putting in a new pipe as well, so a 48-inch pipe. Uh, in that same box culvert that will go between fire station number five and Grand Canyon Trust and um, provide some uh, flood relief into the Rio there. So uh, sh the short-term project will uh, provide a pretty substantial flood relief to the Coconino Estates area, and then we are also working on the long-term project. So the long-term would be uh, a much larger mitigation that would require uh, work actually within Highway 180, so closing portion of Highway 180 to convey more flow to the Rio. So uh, our designer is SWI Ardura, and uh, we're moving quickly on this. Uh, I should mention that uh, short-term mitigation, we were working with ADOT uh, on a daily basis, and they are expected to be complete by mid-July with both 48-inch um, pipe segments. So moving quickly, a lot of great stuff. Uh, fan contracting is their uh, construction phase uh, service contractor for the short-term mitigation. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chase McLeod, one of my project managers here uh, in Stormwater, to provide a quick update on Stavana Way. Hi, Chase McLeod, project manager, City of Flagstaff Stormwater. Uh, give an update on the work that's going on near Stavana Way. Uh, there's two projects going on. One is a new open channel um, going through private, uh, private parcel that will drain um, Stavana Way with the bigger flows. Um, the second project is um, bank stabilization. This was the bank that was um, damaged to the flooding last year. Um, the bank stabilization is eligible for reimbursement. Um, originally, we were an anticipating um, work to be completed by mid-July. However, um, our contractor has worked um, quickly and we're anticipating to be done this coming Friday. Um, Markham was our contractor out of Phoenix. Our, this was designed by SWI Ardura 
and delivered in-house in the stormwater department. All right, thank you, Chase. Um, next up is French Short Pond. Um, so we are hoping to dredge that shortly. We've been working uh, behind the scenes uh, feverishly uh, to see if we can get a contractor on board. Um, I don't have a whole lot to share publicly right now, but we are um, moving quickly to hopefully get this complete uh, in early July. Uh, funding for this would be by uh, some of that DEMA disaster recovery um, due to the, the flows last year, as well as by uh, stormwater. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over. Uh, speaking of DEMA and all things recovery, I'll oh, <laughs> turn it over to Stacy. Would you mind if we're not we, having any more? Would you mind if we asked a couple of questions yeah. about the previous presentation? You're not getting. Oh, I can't get it off easy. Nope. <laughs> Um, council, before I ask questions, do any of you have any questions or comments? Okay, thank you. The plug-in spread that you're doing on the um, Schultz Creek um, upstream, can you explain why that type of mitigation isn't available for the channel behind Grandview? I'm thinking oh, maybe it's space. Got it. Okay. I had to, got it now. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so the purpose of the Schultz Creek plug and spread is that it's about sediment and debris reduction. And it's a very large area to work with. So what we're doing is we're creating these low, almost dams, if you will, maybe a couple feet high and then it allows water to cool up behind it in a very large area. And in the Grandview, we don't have that space. There's actually a very tight space. Um, the drainage easement might be more generous than that, but there's pretty tight space between people's walls and fences and sheds and, and other improvements back there. Um, and it, it's also a bit steeper through there. So we just don't have the, the space to do something like that at that location. Thank you. Um, Ed, is ADOT planning to downsize the pipe when, they, when the final mitigation effort at 180 is done? Ooh, that wasn't the question I was expecting. Uh, so what I was expecting, um, for this short-term mitigation, they are going to put a plate on the 48-inch that goes down towards Northwood Apartments in Stavana. So what that will allow is it will allow more water to be pushed down the new 48 into the Rio, and we are not expecting to see, like we did last year, that bubbler effect uh, near Northwood Apartments. So we are expecting to see a, a great improvement um, from last year, just in this, this short term. Um, to answer your question, for the long-term mitigation, um, we're still working through design, but most likely what we're going to do is we'll have an entirely new conveyance that will move water from the east side of Highway 180 to the Rio, um, and it's, it's likely that we will abandon most of that 48-inch pipe that goes uh, along Highway 180. Um, so that will be either abandoned in place um, or removed, and that's uh, still under design, and we'll be working with ADOT on, on their preference as well, since that is their right of way. Thank you. And Francis Short, hopefully early July, how confident are you in that? Uh, a lot of it's going to really depend on how quickly a contractor can mobilize. And, and the, the reason we don't have really confident um, dates on this is because it's extremely complicated. If you go out there, uh, it's relatively dry on the surface right now. You can actually walk out on what was the pond. Uh, but if you dig, dig down about six inches or a foot, it turns pretty soupy pretty quickly. Um, so making sure that they have the right equipment to get out there, that they're not going to, you know, get stuck with an excavator or a, um, um, a loader, that, that's really kind of high on their list of, you know, they don't want to lose a half million dollar piece of equipment. We don't want to see a piece of equipment out there for six months either stuck in the mud. So uh, there's a lot of moving parts there. Um, so how confident? Uh, we're, we're pushing very hard 
Um, we, we do have deadlines with DEMA for the disaster recovery funds. Uh, and then also, obviously, there's the deadline of Mother Nature. We really want to make sure that we can clear this out before monsoon season so that we have uh, both a pond back for the pond amenity and then also for, like we were using it last year, um, for flood mitigation for downtown and south side. Thank you. Now you can go, Stacy BK. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, so Stacy Reconegs, Grants Contracts Emergency Management Director. Uh, so Interbasin um, Waterline, I was up there for a couple hours this morning, was great. Um, contractors are working hard. Um, and um, Friday, I was able to speak with the governor about the project. And um, just a reminder that, uh, you know, we're losing two to four million gallons a day. 20% uh, of our peak water supply right now, it is flowing up top and creating just a natural creek. It's going, it's not, you know, it's just going into the ground. Nobody's getting that water. Um, and it goes down a 12 mile road, down a gravity fed line. So we really need to, um, to get this um, water flowing and back into our community, into our North Reservoir, which that's where that line ends up filling those two um, tanks in that North Reservoir, which we use to dip um, and use for fire um, uh, uh, dipping out of if we have a fire here. So, so critical water source. So the team is working really hard. Um, there's 45 um, s damaged sites along um, from the top down. Um, and those damaged sites could be anywhere from road damage to damage to the water line. We're finding about five to six places where um, the, line is, the line is actually broke where water is, is coming out. So that's the top priority is really to get the road maintained and get it passable and then um, and, and accessible to the team and then to restore the water. So our contractor, Hunter Contracting, and our design engineer, Jacobs Engineering, been um, up there and looking at every spot that has the break to fix those breaks first. We can get the water flowing and then come back and fix the other areas and damage along the, on the road. Part of this also was working with the Forest Service on the decision memo for um, the environmental. And we think that's um, pretty wrapped up here this, this next week, this week um, in June. So Forest Service, I can't thank them enough for really working on the environmental piece and, um, and that decision memo. We do have um, packs of spotted owls that we have to work around a little bit. Um, so that's causing um, a little bit of problem, but the um, locations where the line is broken is not in the spotted owl pack. So, um, so that's a good thing that we can kind of, we can fix our, our water line. Um, and then um, all of this, the decision memo gets us to that um, permitting for the construction work. And we'll be coming in June, or July 3rd with another GMP um, to continue this project. Uh, we were able to also, Director Torres was at the Friday meeting and thank him and along with the governor. Uh, this project was funded 100% by DFFM at $16.1 million. So um, we're, we're gonna stay within that 16 million, I hope, um, but we're very thankful for the, the funding for this. So with that, um, if there's any questions or are you ready for me to turn it over? Questions? Councilmember Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. Stacy. so um, I remember when you did a presentation earlier this year, I guess it was, on yep. the break and stuff. Um, and I know that the accessibility is the number one. We've got to get there first, right? right, right. Was there any um, options to maybe airlift some workers up there just to start working on the pipes so we're not losing all that water? Or? I think we've able, been able to go both directions from Lockett Meadow and get in that direction. Um, and so they were doing it by side-by-sides when we went up a couple weeks ago and we did um, a tour and we ended up hiking down. They were able to get, you know, those small side-by-sides and get workers in there and materials. So um, right now, um, I think the road is pretty passable for our contractors to get in there. Um, and of course, it's shut down to um, not motorized vehicles and others. So, so I think they're they're good right now um, to get in there with the material. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Brian with the National Weather Service. All right, thank you, uh, Mayor, 
uh, council members. Uh, my name is Brian Klamowski. I'm the meteorologist in charge at the National Weather Service. I've been here about 20 years. We can keep this short and sweet. Normally this time of year, we can see the monsoon circulation starting to form and the impending start of our thunderstorm season. Uh, this is the time that the models are uh, pretty effective in kind of giving us that one to two week look. But what we're seeing right now is the start of the monsoon really is not in sight yet uh, in the next couple weeks. Um, and uh, when it does start, the longer uh, range models um, are showing that it might be a pretty weak start to the monsoon. Now this has both benefits and some negative aspects. The benefits, we can get some work done. You know, um, without the soaking rains of the monsoon, we can continue many of these projects, uh, which we've seen so much progress on so far. But the downside is fire. Fire threat is going to continue to increase. I fully anticipate we're probably going to hear more about fire in the next month than flooding. Okay? Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, as we move on, uh, just one short little graphic here. This shows uh, the three to four week uh, precip outlook. Actually, the image on the left was just updated in the past a week or two, so now it goes through June 23rd, showing that it, uh, and, and actually the new image looks very similar to this one, leaning drier than normal through much of July, or I'm sorry, yes, um, through much of July, uh, through July 21st uh, is what the new graphic would show. So this is just consistent with the model data that we have. Also the image on the right showing a weaker than normal monsoon, or at least one that's leaning in that direction through September as well. So that's all I have for you if there's any questions. Council? Thank you so much. You betcha. <laughs> uh, um, quick update here. Um, I've, you've seen this slide before, but just a reminder um, that call center is live. So if there are any, any needs for engineering assessments uh, or mitigations, that number is 928-213-2102. has not changed. Um, mitigations are holding up well. So we're talking temporary mitigations right now. So sandbags and barriers, um, only those damaged sandbags need to be replaced. And uh, those, again, just as a reminder, those sandbag locations, uh, if you need any, are at Aztec Street, so Thorpe Park, uh, and also at King Street uh, near the County Health Building. Uh, with that, I'll turn it again over to uh, Chase with the call center summary as we move out of preseason mitigation into response. So to sum it up, um, it's been pretty quiet this year um, as far as helping residents place sandbags or deliver. We've done that to three residents so far. Um, most of the calls have just been inquiries or questions on what's going on. Um, we have done an engineering assessment. We have placed pallets for folks to um, place their damaged sandbags on. And we've also filled one resident's barriers with water to refill that. Um, and ongoing work is um, dumpster requests to help residents get rid of those old sandbags. So. That's the update as of now. Thank you, Chase. Um, Stephen Thompson is, is out on vacation today, so I'll cover for him for volunteer days. Uh, the, he did have a very successful one with over 100 volunteers um, palletizing uh, 1,500 salad sandbags and assisting residents with uh, refresh or sandbag walls. Uh, he's also been helping manage uh, with Sonoma of, um, uh, Boynton with the Stream Stewardship Program, uh, a watershed cleanup series. I've been doing this uh, once a month. Uh, in June, they had 30 volunteers remove debris out of the Rio. Our next event is coming up very soon, July 1st. Uh, and if you'd like to sign up for those events, uh, you have his phone number and email at the bottom. So his number is 928-213-2144 or stephen.thompson at flagstaffaz.gov. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sam Beckett. Thanks, Ed. All right, good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, Sam Beckett, Section Director, Public Works. We just wanna give you a quick update on where we are as far as our response readiness. Uh, this past week, we pulled together our operations team is what we call them. 
and uh, reviewed the roles and responsibilities, ensured that we're staffed in the right um, positions and that we're ready to respond if needed. Uh, honestly, it was a very good meeting. Our goal is to uh, continue moving forward with weekly meetings and establish all of our roles and responsibilities as we're also building out our SOPs, so our standard operational guides, so we all understand what those roles and responsibilities look like. Um, right now, we're in a really good spot. As you heard, we're not tracking any monsoonal weather, but the crews are ready to respond if needed. However, we are watching that other side if we do see uh, any kind of fires kick up and understanding that would also change the way our operations look. Same thing with the flood director protocol. One of those items that we reviewed, it will come out and be finalized here shortly. Um, no real changes on that as we kind of have this figured out in the sense of where we're going to see water and uh, how we're seeing that water. So right now it's just making sure everybody has the right data, the right information, and everybody has everybody else's contact information. The uh, early alert gauges maintain, or maintenance was completed. Um, right now all the infrastructure is pretty much in good shape. It's the best way to, to, to state it. Our cameras, gauges are all ready to go and we're kind of just sitting here in this limbo phase hoping that the mitigations uh, beat the monsoons and I think we're in a pretty good, uh, pretty good race right now with those. Again, the water services team, public works and our pros team all met. Um, really good progress there and frankly, I feel very comfortable with where we are. Uh, I actually leave on vacation here starting tomorrow and uh, I have no concerns or issues with it. I'm very happy with where that team is and, and all the work that they put in and they have put in over these last few years. And lastly, we know if that potential comes up, one of the biggest hurdles we have is that emergency response effort and bringing in our contracted services during that emergency response effort. So we're getting ahead of that, working with procurement, understanding how to have everything lined out and be prepared if we see that response. That way there's no lag time in bringing in additional resources. So we're pretty happy with where we are currently. Um, again, just wanting those mitigations to be completed sooner than later. We'll hand it back over to, oh, I'll hand it to Daniel. Thank you. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, Daniel Kelly, your emergency manager. So tonight, I'm going to be real brief for you. Uh, I'm just going to give a 30,000 foot overlook of your EM's response during a large uh, event. One of the important things we'll be doing is liaisoning with the County Emergency Management Agency. Uh, we'll be asking, requesting that they open up the EOC uh, SBK. Uh, we'll most likely report to the EOC and I'll report to the incident command and we'll, we'll liaison together. Uh, develop situational awareness and timely updates. You have received some of those over the past couple of months. Um, and that's one of the biggest things we can do is make sure everybody is aware and that way you guys, um, by the mayor and council and city manager's office, if there is any policy adjustments need to be made, you guys have as much of a head start as we can possibly give you. Um, and then the, we will help manage the common operating picture, the COP. Uh, it is very important that we all work towards the same goal and not duplicating efforts and that allows instant command to um, receive information and action on the information properly. One of the biggest things we'll be doing is probably one of the hardest things is documentation. Uh, if it's not document uh, <laughs> documented, it didn't happen. Um, so we will work with uh, all of our partners to capture as much information as possible during the event. So therefore, we transition to recovery. We have the information. We're not trying to go back and try and do memory recall. Um, and then we will coordinate the transition from uh, response to recovery phase. And currently today, we have five uh, open deck relations that we are trying to close out uh, with the great help of our finance department and uh, disaster coordinator, uh, Amy Hagen, from um, building officials. And, uh, and then the monsoon season. You guys have all seen the checklist that we've been promoting. We're encouraging everybody to sign up for emergency notifications through the county's website uh, and then to review the emergency thresholds. Uh, we've had several of our um, meetings with the community and it's been a good response. Um, and then to assess their temporary uh, flood mitigation measures, which they have been. They've been working with our city partners, with our city staff, uh, it's very encouraging to see and to participate in volunteer days. Uh, like uh, 
Ed just talked about Steve, and he's had a very good uh, volunteer system worked out, and that system doesn't stop, keeps going. And then uh, we just ask that the uh, neighbors be good neighbors. They help out the elderly in their neighborhoods and disabled, and if they can't help, they find uh, either contact our volunteer service uh, through Stephen or uh, some of the staff, and we'll work out how to help them. One of the biggest things is we encourage flood insurance to be, um, to be bought by the homeowners because there is some aid that is available after uh, incidents that happen. However, it is very, very small, and it is nowhere near the amount of money that it takes to actually get back on your feet. And with that being said, I will give it back to you guys for questions. Thank you. Any questions? Councilmember Harris. I don't know if you can answer this question, but I was told that if you buy flood insurance now, it won't be in effect until next year. Is that true, or do you? Am I asking the wrong person? Yeah. I'll let Ed answer that. Uh, that does not sound correct. Uh, so there's both the national flood insurance policy, so the NFIP, as well as uh, relatively recently, there's now private flood insurance, which really confuses things a lot. Um, private is completely privatized, so I, I can't answer to that. For NFIP, there's usually a 30-day waiting period. So, um, and the only uh, exemption to a 30-day waiting period is actually what the Coconino County was able to get uh, lobbied after the Schultz fire. If there is a fire on federal land, um, that 30-day uh, period is waived. But at the moment, it is a 30-day period. Councilmember House. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, this might be a question for you as well. Um, in terms of the National Flood Insurance Program, I know we've asked this before and we were kind of looking into it, but um, it can be a very pricey program. Is there any form of support or, or financial assistance for folks that are attempting to get it but are in an area where it just costs a lot? Yes, yeah, that's, that's a great question. It's a, it's a question not just here in Flagstaff, but nationwide. So as we've talked about before, um, they, they are changing their um, underwriting, if you will, for NFIP. So for the last 40 years, it's been run a particular way. And starting last year and still rolling out, they're under what's what called uh, Risk 2.0. So essentially, Congress told FEMA that they need to become self-reliant. NFIP can no longer uh, be drawing down on the on the federal debt because essentially it was not solvent. Uh, unfortunately, what that means is to make it solvent, they're pushing uh, that financial burden onto the communities. Um, so Risk 2.0, which uh, again was starting to be uh, rolled out last year and it's still in the rollout period, uh, does substantially increase uh, rates for for the majority, not up everybody, but the majority of our community members who have. Uh, flood insurance and, and unfortunately I do not have a good answer to your question of uh, what options we have either locally or nationwide uh, to provide um, financial assistance um, with that relatively large increase in, in flood premiums. Sorry to not have a great answer. I don't see any other questions from council, so I will move on to public comment. First up, we have Sharon Tewksbury Bloom. Thank you, Mayor Daggett and council. As you know, because I was just here, <laughs> I live in the OG flood zone of Grandview Drive, and so I'm very familiar with this. I want to start by just saying, Thank you. I could spend an hour saying thank you to all the people who just spoke. Um, the amount that's being done now and the improvement that we've seen is incredible. Uh, but I will highlight a few things that I would like you to take a look at. Um, first of all, I just want to mention, um, personally, I'm fine with no sidewalks on Grandview, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, we also the thing that we mentioned last week is that we request that the design team models the option to keep the channel natural between Linda Vista and Cedar. We're not saying, you know, obviously all things need to be considered, so I'm not saying we shouldn't consider hardening it, but I want them to actually be modeling and looking at 
uh, could it be left natural? We estimate that there's at least 40 mature trees that are in that area, and so I know uh, Council Member Aslan was mentioning the trees on the wedge that would be cut down. There would be more trees on the wash that would have to be cut down, is my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong about that. But um, we'd like to understand what that looks like, because that is a, a big habitat area, and it is substantial for both natural beauty and um, you know, the lives of all the species that are living there. So in addition, um, one thing I have concern about, and I think it's too early to know what's going on, but as they've been doing the survey work on Grandview for the changing of the street and the replacement of sewer and water, it is very clear from the markings that they've been making that um, a lot of that sewer and water is kind of a Caddy wampus and goes all over the place. So um, I am concerned about what that's going to mean for other infrastructure on private land, such as the stone walls that so many of us have that are currently providing flood protection on our street. So that would be my big question is, are any of the private stone walls going to have to be removed or replaced in the replacement of the sewer and water infrastructure? I'm also wondering what is included in the J.E. Fuller model, because I know Julie was talking about 20% going to the wedge, 20% going to Grandview with an inverted crown, but both of those projects are still in the design phase. So I'm wondering if the model that we saw is including those projects being complete, or is that model as it stands now? And so basically the question is, should we as residents be looking at that model as what to expect this year for the monsoon, or is that what will happen after those projects are complete? And then finally, I hope the city will look into supporting those of us living with mitigation because we're still dealing with blocked walkways and increased dust from all of the sandbag stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And um, staff, I'm going to be asking for um, comments on those questions, but I do have another public commenter. Stephen Poor. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Steve Poor, 1640 West of Vanaway. Um, you got my question on plating, thank you. Uh, so I'll follow up with a question on the long-term uh, mitigation plan on the 180 culvert that ADOT's gonna do. Is it going to be very similar to the 1,000 cubic feet uh, per second that was originally talked about being done up at the Lutheran Church? Thanks. All right, staff, who wants to take which questions? I'll let you fight it out. I'll start with the last one because I remember it. Um, <laughs> uh, we are expecting, uh, and I'd probably, what, are, what is our final queue on 180, Kayla? About 900, so for those of you didn't hear, about 900 CFS, and that's actually a, a fairly large flow. And, and the reason I say that is we have the Schultz Basins intact, so we have 56 acre feet of storage upstream right now. Um, so when we're talking about 900 CFS, moving that from 180 to the Rio, um, it's in a much better shape than what we're talking about on the spruce wash side in terms of that long term. When we start talking about FEMA floodplains and FEMA floodways, we're going to be able to do a, quite a bit on that Schultz Creek side because we have those very large basins and because we have uh, a relatively short run between Highway 180 and the Rio to get water to a, a regional water course. So, uh, thank you, uh, Kayla. Uh, we have roughly 900 CFS on that, so um, a, a huge improvement, and we should be uh, seeing a very good story on the west side. Uh, going back to Spruce Wash and Grandview, uh, to one of the questions, um, what's going to be shared with this Feasibility 2.0 uh, um, study that goes out? will be both that existing conditions, so that is what we see right now and what you should be mitigating to for this monsoon season, as well as the proposed conditions that Julie showed, uh, Julie and Eli. So with the proposed, that's how we expect it to look roughly 
uh, with the completion of those eight projects. Um, and, and I say roughly because as she mentioned, you know, there's a difference between accuracy and precision. There's going to be some small nuances as we get as built and as things uh, move on and then also as the watershed recovers. But uh, at this moment here in 2023, this is our best uh, estimate of what that's going to look like with all eight projects complete. And I apologize if I just missed this, but d does the modeling exist currently for current conditions going into this monsoon season? Correct. So that's what we're calling the existing conditions model. So that's the model that was done in November by J.E. Fuller. And we've shared it already. It is on the website, but it'll be shared again with this feasibility 2.0. So whenever we have a development, you have your existing condition and you have your proposed condition. Existing is what you see right now. So we do have that. Uh, it's on the website and will be shared again through this feasibility 2.0. And that is what we are using for mitigation uh, right now today. And it's what uh, residents can use right now today for this year. And then we'll also new, this is just coming out now, is that proposed condition model so that we will have that proposed map uh, that will be going out. And again, that's not today. That's what we're hoping to see in three years. Uh, with all those eight projects completed and that will be a map of, of what we expect to see at that time and again there'll be some revisions as as we mentioned you know we'll have new design components and new uh, survey going into each of these projects so it's going to be revised through time but it's the proposed condition that we have right now um, other questions um, so one question was can we leave that open channel between Linda Vista and Cedar or can we at least model what it looks like to leave it natural? Yeah, or I mean, have you modeled it? Well, the it? existing condition really is the model for leaving it natural because that's what it is right now. It's natural right now. And I, I pause to call it natural. It's naturalized. It has grass in it. It has trees in it. It's definitely not natural. Everything through there has been channelized. The, the original spruce wash never went in that direction. It would kind of curved through and it was a small little ditch. But... Um, Really, that existing condition model, we have both velocity and we have depth. And so it is modeled right now as natural. And that's why we are showing that we're going to have to do some type of modification. Eli mentioned that. You know, we're seeing very high velocities through there. Uh, the chance for scour, the chance for moving sediment, the chance for undercutting and having lateral erosion, which would be really bad because that's when we start losing fences and backyards, is very high. So th there is something we're going to have to do there. Um, we understand the concerns, obviously, of, of anybody who has a house right next to that channel. Um, all we can say is uh, we understand those concerns, and we're working uh, with the, the engineers, the designers for that area, to see what we can do. Um, you know, our hope is to, I mean, all of our hopes, the reason why we live in Flagstaff and not in another community is, you know, we like nature just like everybody else. So our hopes is to provide as little disturbance as possible, but in some of these conditions, um, uh, the, the reality is we have very high velocities and very high water depths and, and unfortunately in some areas we may have to harden it. But um, we do know the concerns and we're, we're working as best as we can with the constraints we're given. So when, so before any construction is done in that area, will there be modeling that shows what's likely to come down once the three detention basins and the um, little triangle piece the down at the, the wedge uh, is installed? That's a great question. So will we have, let me see if I understand it correctly. Will we have a new model with all three parkway basins in place as well as the wedge? Um, I don't know if I have a clear answer on that right now. I mean, we do have the proposed condition model which has the existing parkway basin in it, so the first of the three, and it does have the wedge in it. Now, we're not really expecting to see much difference in flow with two new parkway basins going in, into um, play, if you will. And the reason why is those basins, again, are not meant as flood detention. They're meant for sediment. So we're hoping to drop out sediment there. In terms of flood detention, they don't really work that great because they're too small. Um, and that's just the fact that we're, we're already in the urban environment. We're in the built environment. So we can't build something like the Schultz Basins in that small of an area. Um, so 
that's kind of one of those differences between Schultz and Spruce. Schultz, we have the ability because we had a 20-acre city-owned parcel. And Spruce, there's really just not that much land to work with before we get into the forest. Thank you. And, and I know that we all recognize the constraints of um, not wanting to harm downstream residents as well as the area around here. But thank you for looking at all options. And wasn't there another question about the walls? Yes, thank you. Mayor, I can answer that one. And I think um, Sharon was talking about the blue stake marks that are out there. Um, we've had a heck of a time finding out exactly where that existing water line is. I think we found it. Um, but moving forward with the, the utilities, the proposed utilities, those are not going back in the same location. The water and sewer mains are not going back um, for the most part, 90%. Um, in the same location that they are today. Those will be in the roadway prism under the asphalt section, the water and sewer mains. Um, we can't put them in the same place because we need to keep service going um, while construction is underway. So we'll be cleaning that up a little bit, the location. As for will it cause a disturbance to the walls or some improvements that folks have done, you know, we need to make those service connections. So we need to make the water and sewer connections and we're planning to do that around the back of curb. If for some reason there's something in the way at the back of curb to be able to make that connection, then the contractor would work with the property owner and do a replacement or um, try to work around whatever that improvement is at that particular location. But we're going to stick in the road as much as we can. Thank you. Council, comments, questions? All right. Thank you so much for the update. And we are going to take a 15-minute break.
Okay, we are going to get back at it. We're moving down to item number 10, update on the downtown vision and action plan. Take it away. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Should we wait for... Okay. I'm Michelle McNulty, Planning Director for the City of Flagstaff. As you'll recall, I provided a brief update on the downtown um, action or the downtown vision and action plan at one of your last council retreats. I'm here this evening with David McIntyre, the community investment director, and Terry Modeska, the executive director for the downtown business association to provide a more in-depth uh, update. Just a little background, this plan was initiated to help align the city, county, mountain line, Downtown Business Alliance and other interested parties into a unified vision for the downtown that addresses its physical form, its overall manage it, management, and its continued activation, among other important topics. This project is being led by the Downtown Business Association with funding and participation by the city, county, and Mountain Line. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Terry Modeska for the rest of the presentation. Well, thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, Mayor, or evening. Good evening, uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. As Michelle said, I am Terry Medexa. I'm the Executive Director for the Flagstaff Downtown Business Alliance, and I am thrilled to be here today to provide an update on the downtown vision process and our pathway forward. And I will just say it's been a long time coming. <laughs> um, it's been a while since I've presented to Council, in fact, for some on council, this will be your first update. So before we get started, I wanted to provide some guiding statements. This vision has been underway for a long time. There were some delays due to COVID. We had some staff transition and then some more staff transition and COVID kept, you know, kept going for a while. But now there is renewed energy and strong commitment from our partners to see this get over the finish line. The language throughout the document needs to be revised. We understand that. However, many of the findings are relevant and will be shared with you during this presentation. The draft document has been distributed to city and county staff for feedback and the entire document will be updated once we collect those comments. Once the document is revised, we plan on a meaningful public input process. We realize those that participated in this process a few, a few years ago need to be re-engaged, as well as community groups, residents in adjacent neighborhoods, and the general public. We would just like to have city staff feedback and a revised document before we move forward to gather everybody's input. As I mentioned, I realize for some on council, this is your first presentation on the downtown vision, and for others, it's been a while. So I wanna start with a brief overview of what led us to undertake the downtown vision in the beginning. This process began in 2018. We realized that conversations about projects and development downtown seemed to happen in silos. We had major projects being planned with the Downtown Connection Center, the new municipal courthouse, and then the county discussing moving several departments out of downtown. And I remember I found out about each of those things in one week's time, and not from any meeting I was a part of. It was just someone saying, did you hear about this, or did you hear about that? And it led us to understand that there wasn't a unified vision for downtown's growth. And so that's where this idea came from, is how do we um, bring all parties together, including downtown stakeholders and residents, and develop a shared and agreed upon vision for the future of our downtown. Our funding partners include the city, county, mountain line, and the DBA. We went through a competitive RFP process and ultimately selected Progressive Urban Management Associates as the consultant and it was based on their expertise in other downtowns across the country. I won't read everything on this slide, but I'd like to highlight a few of the key goals. 
One is to develop a market-based vision through a collaborative process. This is something that hasn't been done in downtown before. So having this, you know, it's not just a vision, but it's actually based on a market analysis of what our downtown needs, I think is really critical. It is to encourage meaningful engagement, to identify opportunities for investment, especially housing and employment, and to focus on public space activation, walking, cycling, and transit. One of our guiding principles is to create a call to action to be bold, proactive, and to actually guide downtown's evolution, not just let it happen to us. That's been happening for a long time. We want to help influence future development and the direction our downtown evolves. This plan was built on existing plans, particularly the regional plan, housing plan, climate action, south side community plan, and the comprehensive parking plan. Each of these plans helped influence the downtown vision, and our hope is that our downtown vision will be integral to development of the 2045 regional plan. This plan also highlights some catalytic opportunity sites. Some of these sites are publicly owned, others are still privately owned. These are intended to show what could happen, not necessarily what is currently planned. Um, I also wanted to point out that even though we've been doing this work for some time, um, we've already seen some initial successes from the downtown vision process. In the midst of our work, COVID impacted our progress. But we remained engaged and we shifted our work to more immediate action. We work with our the consultant team and the city to focus on business support and economic stability. We had to think differently and move quickly. And I wanna take this time to just thank city staff and leadership for working with us to implement some of these ideas. Many of the practices put in place during COVID are still in place today. Some examples include the Aspen Alley, which we have closed to vehicles in the summer and fall, and it now serves as an additional location for outdoor dining and activation. The city installed gazebos in Heritage Square to expand opportunities for outdoor seating and dining. Our, part pay, our paid parking program was suspended for a period of time and pick up and drop off zones were created. Once parking was re-implemented, the hours were reduced and 20 minute curbside parking remains today. All of this is the result of the Euro team, which is a multidisciplinary team that continues to meet and focus on expanded use of rights of way. Also during this time, group meetings were not taking place. So to keep the process moving, we conducted an online survey where more than 1,200 citizens responded. I realize this is now three years old, but the responses are significant and likely hold true today. Respondents value the historic character of downtown and want to see that maintained. They would like downtown to be more walkable and bikeable with expanded beautification efforts. They would also like to see some vacant sites redeveloped and the parking experience improved. We will conduct another survey to gauge current priorities, but I, my guess is the results will be very similar. The key policy recommendations will also likely remain very similar. The first is to promote downtown Flagstaff as the hub of economic activity and innovation for the region. We want to preserve the historic core of downtown, ensure the city's climate action plan is woven into the fabric of the downtown vision, and we can help achieve these goals by seeing some added housing and improved connectivity. I, I think of downtown as a place for, for housing, and I've talked with many of you on council about how I'd love to see downtown and housing, or housing in downtown be part of the conversation. I hear about developments throughout the city, and um, I think downtown is really sort of the center of where we should be focusing our efforts with housing. If we allow some gentle density in areas where there isn't conflict with historic preservation 
or adjacent neighborhoods, downtown can truly become a place to live, work, visit, and stay. A market assessment was completed and this will need to be updated. Even though the numbers may change, the result is going to be close to the same. Flagstaff is on the lower end of housing density and employment when compared to other similar cities. While both of these aren't ideal positions, they are opportunities for the future of our downtown. One of the top priorities of the downtown vision is to see additional housing at all price points. Like the city, we know development of housing is crucial and downtown is perfectly positioned for more housing units. The Downtown Connection Center is proximate. Downtown has amenities such as restaurants, retail, community events, and it is walkable. However, we realize for this to happen, we will have to identify logical sites and allow some gentle density where appropriate. Additional employment is another opportunity. Our partners at Discover Flagstaff do an amazing job showcasing downtown as a visitor destination and our businesses thrive on that traffic. However, downtown should also be considered as a place for investment, entrepreneurship, and business. Downtown is home to mostly independently owned businesses, and we are very fortunate. That is one dynamic that makes downtown Flagstaff unique and authentic. However, for downtown to become a true neighborhood, we should also be home to an urban grocery, drugstore, and other amenities residents desire. As I mentioned, downtown is already considered a destination for visitors. Expanding public art, events, and celebrations like Lunar Legacy and Winter Wonderland are perfect opportunities for residents and visitors to extend their time in downtown. The vision statement for downtown is to enhance and create a downtown that is vibrant, walkable, historic, and adaptable, thriving, welcoming, and accessible to all. While we have talked about broad goals, the downtown vision also provides a roadmap to help us achieve this vision by offering tactics and actions. Most of what is on this slide has already been stated, but for our downtown to remain economically vibrant, our efforts need to be on positioning downtown as a premier destination for investment, growing residential options, attracting more jobs, supporting the storefront economy, and growing local arts and culture opportunities. There is more detail on the catalytic opportunity sites in the draft plan that was sent to you last week. However, I wanna to touch on a few. The former city municipal courthouse site is on everyone's mind. It is currently a surface parking lot in the core of downtown. It is not an ideal use in any way. We have an opportunity to see at a minimum three quarters of a block and potentially a full block turn into a mixed use development that also serves as the gateway into downtown. It could be transformational. There are three bank sites on Birch that are perfectly positioned for housing. A bank building surrounded by surface parking is no longer the model. Those sites are not in conflict with historic preservation and are not surrounded by residential neighborhoods they are perfectly positioned for housing. The east side of downtown is similarly positioned and also underdeveloped. Both of these could serve as additional transformational opportunities for our downtown. In addition to supporting economic vitality, offering an experience that makes people want to live and spend their time in downtown is key. We heard from our residents, they value the historic character of downtown and want to see that preserved. There are recommendations in the plan that protect our history. The efforts of city staff and the FDBA have focused on increasing public space activation, public art and events. A continuation of our work during COVID. And I'm going to sneak in so you know that this year in 2023, the DBA, with the support of our city partners, we are adding 160 
events to Heritage Square this year. So um, think of what downtown would be like without all that activity and opportunity for people to come in and spend their time. There is more for us to do, focusing on infrastructure, alley improvements, and tree wells. Many of those elements are included in the downtown vision as action items. And finally, mobility. The most successful downtowns are ones that are walkable and bikeable with a strong public transit system. This is a priority that is aligned with the Flagstaff community and there is already a lot of support. This plan also calls for the need to have some parking added. Both can be true. You can have a downtown where residents and visitors walk, bike, and take transit while also having basic infrastructure that allows people to park once and then walk. It is not one or the other, we need both. Most of what is in the draft plan remains accurate, even if the tone is out of date. However, where we will see some revision is with the action plan. Once we have feedback from city and county staff, we will work to complete the recommendations, roles and responsibilities, and funding sources. So that is to come. So where does that leave us? We are seeking feedback from our city and county partners now. And once we have a revised draft plan, we will release for public input this summer. Our hope is to be back before council for approval in the fall. Uh, one caveat is we want to make sure that our public outreach is broad and meaningful. And so if our timeline, it may slip a little, but we would rather have that genuine public outreach before we come back to council. So our hope is the fall, um, but we're, it, we may have to adapt a little based on ensuring we do a good job with our outreach. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, questions, comments? Council, Council Member McCarthy and then Council Member House. Well, thank you, Terry. I'm actually very excited about this. And I think uh, the things I heard tonight are right on. Um, a couple of notes I took, your emphasis on housing, um, I think is very important. Um, I think if you can bring some housing to the area, we can get more walkability. Uh, you know, yes, we do need some more parking. Uh, I, I, when I read the packet, I saw those little charts of the priorities of the people you surveyed, and parking was up there, but maintaining historical character was number one. Mm -hmm. So, um, and density, and just as a general statement for downtown and for the whole city, uh, makes bikeability, walkability more practical and is actually very consistent with um, uh, reducing carbon emissions because if people can walk to a place, I don't know how hard it's going to be to get a small grocery store down there, but I could see that that would be very useful, especially, you know, it's kind of the chicken and the egg thing. It's like if we get more housing will need more grocery stores mm -hmm. and we'll get a grocery store because someone will build one if it makes sense. So uh, yeah, I'm, again, I'm very excited about what I heard tonight and what I read in the packet. Um, so uh, I look forward to seeing it happen. And in the particular that uh, old courthouse site, uh, I agree with you. That uh, could be a very exciting project it could have parking, it could have residential, it could have uh, some more coffee shops, it could have, a, you know, a grocery store. Mm -hmm. In other words, commercial, residential, and parking. It could do all of those things, and it might be five stories high, but so what? Uh, that would be great. Anyway, I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member McCarthy. I appreciate it. And um, my excitement to see this process move um, matches yours. One last thing. Those flowers in that one shot, were they taken from a little store by her store? <laughs> Council Member House. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Terry. This was an amazing presentation. Um, it's very, very exciting, and 
I think uh, the most beautiful thing about this to me is the way that it unifies so many of the goals for our city in terms of housing and uh, infill development, sustainable development, sustainability in general, carbon neutrality, all of those things coming together in one um, plan and one vision that really advances everything that, that our city is, has been asking for and uh, very much needs is just a beautiful thing to see. So um, just very excited to see a lot of this come to fruition and um, very excited by some of the different proposals that are, are already evident in this. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member House. I appreciate your comments. Council Member Sweet. Thank you. That is my store in the photo, Mr. McCarthy. I'm famous. That, that was intentional. <laughs> I know who I was presenting to. <laughs> you gotta read your audience. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for the presentation. I've been lucky to be kind of part of this from the beginning and I love seeing the updates. And I, I feel like this is a very special time for our downtown. I moved here in the early 90s, and I remember when Heritage Square was a dirt lot, and I would bring my Volkswagen bus and romp in the, the hills, catch air. And my store, where it is located, was just a pile of rock. So look at where we've come from there. And I get the honor of looking to see where we're going to go, and that's um, very exciting. I love this plan. I love that it encompasses all types of housing. I think you're spot on on that, and that's exciting to see. Higher paying jobs, creating a welcoming space for all. The plan also looks at connectivity, which is a passion of mine, and includes all of the plans, the South Side, the regional, the climate action and adaptation, the community, the South Side community plan, the housing plan, the downtown parking study. I mean, you covered it all, and, and thank you for the thoroughness on that. I do believe it will be crucial to have all of our partners at the table and working on this as a collective. And you brought that up yourself, and I just really appreciate that you, you value that. And I just thank you, and thank you to the community and our partners for um, creating a future vision for our downtown. It's a very exciting time. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Harris. Uh, great presentation. Um, I've not been to downtown LA, but my son lives in downtown LA. And for a young freelancer with not a lot of money, he's found an amazing place to live, live for really cheap, so I know it can be done. There's a grocery store that he walks to there's a drugstore that he can go to. Uh, there are um, health centers in, uh, in the area. And everything he needs is right downtown. Um, and they've got all kinds of housing, low income or, or workforce housing, if that's what you want to call it. And then right across from him is a luxury apartment building. So they've got all kinds of people that live in that area. And so downtowns can be really, really nice if you do it correctly. So with that being said, I think it's a great plan, but I have some concerns. I have some concerns, and only me can probably say this, about people in our community who do not want to see that kind of growth. So that's going to be a conversation that we're going to have to have, because if you're talking about upgrading your downtown and bringing in all these other things, that means we're going to grow. And so that's a tough conversation for some of us. And some of us are those people who own businesses downtown. So <laughs> I'm just being really, mm -hmm. you know, out front there, and I'm assuming that you probably know who those folks are, um, and you're probably figuring out how to work with them. But I, I say that because I don't want to throw, I'm not throwing like a wrench in the works because I'm really supportive of this. But the other thing is that we don't, it seems like we haven't pulled other people into this. So my concern is, is we have thousands, thousands mm -hmm. of visitors, and they all don't um, live downtown when they come here. They live in all the other hotels all around us. And I'm wondering why no one has had a conversation with 
those hotels and asking them to maybe put on some shuttles. That's one way of getting people out of downtown with cars. Because if, you know, every time I go to a large conference and I'm in a major city, I can jump on a hotel shuttle and pretty much go anywhere. Um, and I don't have to, well, I wouldn't drive a car in some of those cities anyway, but, uh, you know, that's, that's something that we ought to think about is how do we get those other hotels um, involved in this and would they play nicely in the sandbox? I'm not sure, but maybe. Because uh, it's in, you know, something in it for them because um, visitors, they don't know where they're going. You know, yeah, they use their GPS, but sometimes those GPSs are not, you know, friendly. Mm -hmm. And so you wind up trying to go down one-way streets. Um, and so, yeah, I've seen people do that. Uh, so anyway, those are just some things that just come to, to my mind, but uh, like I say, um, it's, a, it's a great idea, it's a great plan, and it's workable, and we can do it, but everybody's got to be on board, or uh, enough of us mm -hmm. have to be on board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Vice Mayor, if I may respond to Councilmember Harris briefly, um, your, your comments about um, the sensitivity of development um, is is something that I take with me every day. It's on my mind every minute of every day. But I also feel like we're at a point in our community where if there is going to be any height at all, it needs to be downtown. And we can pick logical sites that don't compromise our historic um, character and is not immediately adjacent to um, surrounding neighborhoods. So ex for example, those bank sites on Birch, it makes an awful lot of sense to me. You have the 1980s model of Chase Bank surrounded by a half block of surface parking and we're not, th there's no conflict with any type of historic preservation and there are several blocks surrounding in all sides from any type of neighborhood. Um, it's the same scenario on the east side of downtown. And I understand I can't play with private property owner, you know, with their rights. I understand that. But if you think for a moment about um, what's on the east side, it's very underdeveloped. It's, it abuts Route 66 and a dispensary and there's no historic neighborhood around. Um, and so I feel like at least in those locations where it makes the most sense, we could see some height and some gentle density. Um, that's the term we're using. We're, we're not um, suggesting anything that has huge massing. We could use different materials um, so it breaks up what a development looks like. We want it to be appropriate for downtown. So your comments are, um, uh, they land with me very well. These are the, th the very things that I think about. And I, I do appreciate your comment about engaging the hotels. I think that's a great idea and something we can definitely try to do. I think you might have misunderstood my comments, so I'm not against it. Okay. I'm just saying that there are people, even in our downtown, who are, mm -hmm. and if you have not um, what do you want to say, how to court it them, mm -hmm. um, for lack of a better word, um, it's going to meet with a lot of opposition. Yep, understood. So, yeah, so I get it. I'm there, but you've got a lot of folks that are not still. Yep. So anyway, just wanted to let you know that. I uh, understood, and um, w we will um, do our due diligence in reaching out and engaging um, and then we will also provide um, what we can to make sure that the people who are involved feel comfortable taking this action for downtown. Councilmember Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. Terry, um, this was a great presentation. I'm new on council, so this is the first time I've heard about um, this committee or this group, this vision plan, but not really much detail, so this was really great to to hear some of the stuff. Um, one thing that jumped out at me, and I was just a little confused. I mean, I think it's great how I, I love the fact that we're putting a, a, a vision, a planning into our downtown instead of hodgepodge. 
Um, but I'm curious, like when you mentioned the bank properties, I, I'm assuming Chase owns all that parking. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some city land um, in there, but ha has there been a strategy or a thought to, okay, how, how do we attract developers to, to develop in this vision mm -hmm. um, to our vision? to the city's vision versus, you know, do we have to do some, some um, zoning changes? And then is there a plan to approach banks um, that have these large footprints downtown? Um, what do you think the odds of that are? Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member Matthews, thank you for the question. Um, you know, that's a, it's a good one when you're dealing with um, private property owner land, <laughs> you know, I'm sort of playing in my mind about what could be. Um, but I, I'll let you know, especially with the bank sites, there is some interest in the private sector um, from developers. And we're having conversations right now with um, the city's community investment team, uh, Dave McIntyre and Jack Fitchett, um, wondering just what you're talking about is how do we help facilitate these connections? We know there's interest. We know Chase Bank um, had this property for sale years ago, and so we, we believe and hope there is interest. We just need to find a way to make that connection happen between a developer and the private property owner and our work with the city to, to sort of help navigate that. Um, and so how likely are these private developments? Um, none of them are, you know, in the design phase. These, the property hasn't changed ownership, but we're at the time now with this process moving forward to make those connections and to see if, if we can facilitate a deal. So I'm hopeful. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Terry, good to see you. Um, thanks for the presentation. Really exciting vision. Uh, I'm a very enthusiastic sporter. Uh, I really like the idea, thinking 10 years out, of seeing more gentle density, as you called it, to the east and where the courthouse is, and just seeing a lot of people coming in and out of these spaces and occupying the space. Um, I wanted to mention two things. I, 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 uh, I appreciate the fact that Councilmember Harris brought up the, the, the concerns about growth. Um, I don't really, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're not going to receive too much um, pushback and opposition to this. I think one of the things that might be important to do uh, to help grease the skids here is to make sure when we're talking about general density, which is a term I like, uh, we're careful to frame it as an urban lifestyle um, family living, uh, you know, like your, our, our, our dink population, dual income, no kids, uh, not NAU students. So we're not encouraging off-campus student dormitories. We're encouraging a, a, a new urban feel and center to, to Flagstaff. And, you know, there's, we can balance out the language on that, but just to be preemptively uh, casting this vision of a, a, a downtown where lots of people can live that disassociates the conversation a little bit from the past that we've had with off-campus student dormitories and the strong feelings that those evoke. Mm -hmm. So that's all I want to say without getting too detailed or, or prescriptive about it. And then um, and feel free to comment on that. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to give you a chance to speak on, which I didn't really see in the presentation, um, is how we're planning out for safety in the downtown area, which has some specific considerations that might be different than other areas in town and would be a conversation that needs to streamline and, and bring in our, our police department mm -hmm. um, and other aspects of, of the city apparatus. So i give you a chance to speak about that a little bit. I'm curious to see, uh, I, it, it's curious to me that it's missing from here, I, I think it's a worthy part of the conversation that should be up front and, and a big part of this. And then also just the other, the other things that are already in motion 
um, that we know are happening and how excited we are about those and, and how you know we use it as a shoehorn to slip into this new way of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. The Downtown Connection Center, uh, the, 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 the Rio de Flag upgrades, that, that the, the underpasses that are gonna, gonna be going in for pedestrian use. Um, let's, let's make sure that conversation is facilitating and um, synergistic with what we're talking about here. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor Aslan, those are really excellent points. Um, you know, the, your, your point about incorporating safety, I think is really key and that's something we'll make an effort to do. So the next time you look at this, you'll see um, that it will jump out at you. We do have um, representatives from police and fire that are reviewing this plan. Um, they're some of the staff that I mentioned that have a chance to review and provide input. So not only will that input be incorporated, we'll make sure it stands out more. So thank you for that. And any comments on the urban lifestyle or uh I don't know how far to go with that. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're just spot on. And that would be, I mean, that's sort of what the DBA stands for is creating this livable downtown. Um, people that can support our businesses. And, and I mean this at, um, you know, housing at, at all cost points. Um, so we're not just talking about above market rate housing. This is at all price points, but it really is geared towards um, the resident, the person who's going to live in downtown, walk downtown, support downtown, utilize our public spaces as their backyard. Um, so that is built into the very nature of this process. But you're, you're spot on and we align with that entirely. Wonderful, and I like the way that you talk about it. You have a much more nuanced, refined uh, way to speak about it. I'll have to learn about that from you. Um, oh geez, I think there was one more thing I just wanted to mention, um, and I am not remembering what it is. So I, the conversation will be ongoing now. Thank you. Councilmember McCarthy. Um, <clears throat> does this plan incorporate what's going on south of the railroad tracks as well? Uh, a council member, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Dad Heidi, she's causing problems. <laughs> um, my question is your plan, uh, it's a good plan. Does it incorporate some improvements to the uh, area of South Side, south of the railroad tracks? It, it uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member McCarthy, it does. Um, so the site plan that we looked at was primarily north side um, uh, at Cherry, going all the way south to Butler and then Humphreys over to um, oh, Eldon. Yeah, I think there's been a couple projects uh, down on South San Francisco mm -hmm. Street uh, that would uh, be consistent with the, the vision that you have. Yes. And, you know, and, and I also agree with Mr. Aslan's comments about, you know, we need to focus on young professionals and, and you know, but I also mm -hmm. agree with what you said. It's not just one tier we're looking for, we're looking for a variety of tiers, but uh, we have a lot of student housing and, and that's good. It's actually getting people out of regular housing, get the students into the student housing so that the, like in area where I live, the townhouses, you, which used to be like almost all peer students are now almost all families. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, enough said. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member McCarthy, I think our, our vision is to see downtown develop as a true neighborhood. And for downtown to be a neighborhood, we need all residents, we need families, we need retired, we need singles, we, we, need, we need it all. And I, I would argue that our businesses need that as well. We are uh, one of the top visitor destinations in the country, and I'm grateful that we have Heidi and Discover Flagstaff as our partners that have made downtown the visitor destination that it is. And I think now we need to work collectively to make downtown the neighborhood that it could be. So keep our visitor destination, we love it. 
um, but I, I think we need, um, we need to see more when our visitors aren't here. I still wanna see our sidewalks filled with people. I want people coming to jazz on the square, supporting our downtown businesses when our visitors aren't here. And a neighborhood will do that. So I guess you want to cater to everybody from Forrest Gump to Paul McCartney. <laughs> Councilmember Harris. <laughs> I was just gonna um, mention that uh, south of the tracks, there is a neighborhood uh, two blocks over, one block over from San Francisco. So I think it would be important to keep that community in mind because it is an older community. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you're planning on moving south of the tracks, it's worth it to reach out to that neighborhood. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member Harris, we want to cast a really wide net to engage everyone we can. Um, I, I will point out, though, in terms of the vision, I mean, I want their engagement and their input um, without question. In terms of the downtown vision, the areas where um, our, our efforts really are focused are the commercial districts, so it's San Francisco, Beaver and um, a little bit over by the Downtown Connection Center and Mike's Pike. So there's, there's only effort to connect to the neighborhood, but the actual ideas of development or infrastructure improvements um, or how do we care for the civic space, those are the, the key points that are in the vision related to the south side. But that does affect the neighbors that live there. Whatever you're doing in that civic space and in commercial space on San Francisco, it does. And we've already had issues okay. uh, with, with uh, some of the businesses there. Uh, okay. So um, we did that a couple months ago or maybe almost a year ago. Where we had a lot of uh, community output in terms of noise and bars and that kind of stuff. Okay. So just be aware of that. And I okay. guess you can talk with our city manager. He can probably tell you all about it. Thank uh, you. Well, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member Harris, perhaps I, I will speak with City Manager Clifton, but I could also reach out and um, maybe just get some more information from having conversations with you. So I would appreciate that. Vice Mayor. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. I think I refound my thought. Um, you know, I really like how you talked about downtown as the appropriate place for gentle density to be happening. It seems like it's our, you know, it's our gateway drug uh, into, uh, in terms of how we slip into a broader conversation about how we're growing up instead of out. And uh, I just think there's going to be less opposition for that conversation uh, as we move forward. And I'm looking forward to that bearing out. Um, you know, the, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, we're relocating the hospital. And so what's happening up on top of Hospital Hill right now will clearly play into mm -hmm. this visioning process moving forward. I just wanted to give voice to that. Uh, didn't see it in the presentation too much. But just as we're redeveloping some things south of the tracks, what's happening up on the hill can mm -hmm. absolutely have an impact on the vibrancy that we're looking for. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing I wanted to point out here, too, is this is a real aha, linchpin sort of when things click. This is a, a great thing for all of us to be showcasing and proudly talking about in terms of how we uh, engage both of our emergencies that we've declared and show that these things can be addressed in a way that's synergistic and uh, checking all boxes as opposed to zero sum or robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, so just a real good feel good opportunity for us to be showcasing how we're tackling both of these concepts at once in a, in a way where all boats are lifted. And then lastly, I, I didn't get a chance to mention this before. I definitely wanted to. I think you said 160 events this year or? New events, new added yeah. events. 
that's an amazing uh, accomplishment. It demonstrates, it betrays an amazing amount of work on your part and the part of your staff. These things don't happen organically. They need to be programmed. And the role you have in our downtown is essential. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and make sure you felt seen um, and appreciated because that's a really, really big accomplishment. And it makes all the difference in terms of our downtown being occupied and feeling vibrant and keeping things safe through a, a community that's engaged and utilizing the space. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor Aslan, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Council, any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, sorry. Um, I understand that um, we have a new program starting, hopefully in the fall, the ambassador program, mm -hmm. to address those safety concerns. Um, and it now gets more and more important, um, especially adding all these events that our visitors um, feel safe and they don't you know, minimize the in negative encounters. And so I just wanna really put an emphasis on that. Um, I worked in a town that had um, a lot of crime activity and we were very present to you have one bad incident and it can really have a ripple effect on future events and activities downtown. So I'm happy to know that we have this ambassador program coming on board very soon and I just want to emphasize that that might even need to be ramped up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say it out in, in public forum. Mm -hmm. um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Member Matthews, that's a great point. And I would imagine I will be back before you um, to provide additional information on the outreach program and go through those details. So I look forward to that. And it, it, it is um, very necessary um, to keep people feeling comfortable while they're downtown. All right, if there are no further comments or questions, we're going to take um, public comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have Tyler Denham. Tyler, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute, you can offer your comments now. Hi, my name is Tyler Denham. I'm calling in as a private resident with some thoughts on the downtown Flagstaff vision and action plan. A bit of early public outreach, I suppose. Although uh, a lot of the points I intended to make, you actually covered in your discussion, um, which was really interesting to listen to. Uh, first off, I want to thank the people and organizations that worked on the plan. As a resident of the planning area, I live right at the southeast corner. Uh, it was a fascinating read and obviously took a lot of time and effort. Uh, that said, I do have some constructive criticism. The plan mentions several times the need for better parking management and more parking supply. I agree wholeheartedly with the need for better parking management, but I'm a bit skeptical of the need for more parking supply. The section of downtown north of the tracks is already 25 to 30% off street parking. With proper management, which would include appropriate pricing and shifting existing supply to a shared parking model, you could potentially improve access to downtown without having to add any new spaces. And my fear and why I think it's important to look at this is that adding more parking could actually hurt downtown. Land utilized for parking is land that can't be used for additional commercial space, housing, or open space. And that's important because the main thing holding, one of the main things holding back economic growth in downtown seems to be a lack of space. The plan mentions the office vacancy rate is 1% and the rental vacancy rate is 2%. It's not clear to me when that data was collected, but if it still holds true, both are far, far below healthy levels. Residents clearly desire to work and live in downtown Flagstaff, but with vacancy rates that low, no one can come in without someone else leaving. And potentially more parking lots would shrink the pie when it seems there's already not enough pie to go around. And I want to zoom out a bit and connect this to a broader point. 
underlying the statement that downtown needs more parking is an assumption that more vehicles means more economic growth. Vehicles support goods delivery, commuting to jobs, and access to businesses, so more vehicles means more economic activity, so the thinking goes. Uh, but that assumption is actually wrong. Uh, it's true that vehicle travel supports goods delivery, uh, commuting, and access to businesses, but vehicle travel also imposes significant economic costs. Things like traffic congestion, road wear, crashes, air pollution, and loss of land to parking. Walking, biking, and public transit do the same things as vehicle travel, but at much lower cost. Tyler, uh, this is why studies, yes. Tyler, I am so sorry, but your three minutes is up. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and reiterate, thank you for making the plan. Greatly appreciate everyone that put work into it, and I look forward to future public comment. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, would it be appropriate for me to provide a brief answer? Um, um, you know, and I, I would welcome the chance to have this conversation in more detail with Tyler. We've talked briefly before tonight. Um, I, I don't think the downtown vision um, goes against what Tyler is suggesting. I, I don't think anywhere in the plan do we call for more surface lots. Um, you know, that isn't what anybody wants to see um, as the fabric of their downtown. But as there are developments that occur, whether you take the Flagstaff Senior Living Site or if you take the former municipal courthouse site, I, I would argue that some form of par public parking is necessary in those developments. Um, anytime you have housing or it could be uh, retail, when we have 90% of our visitors that do arrive by car, and I know we're making great strides to improving our public transportation with frequency and with additional routes, all of that matters, but there still needs to be a basic infrastructure of parking in downtown. We have one public parking lot, or excuse me, one public parking garage, which is at Heritage Square. The other two public parking lots um, at the former municipal courthouse site and the Flagstaff Senior Living Site, both of those should and will be developed. Um, I just think that some form of public parking needs to be part of it. Hidden, I don't think it should be a garage. I don't anticipate um, a block that is developed solely as a parking structure, but, they sh but par parking should be incorporated into some uh, development activity, particularly on the periphery of downtown. That's our opinion. Thank you. All right. Great discussion. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. I really appreciate your time. See you this weekend on the square. Oh, um, unfortunately, I won't be at this movie, um, but I will be at the next movie, and I will welcome you with great celebration. And thank you for supporting Movies on the Square. All right, moving down to item number 11, review and discuss proposed procurement code manual revisions for amending articles one through seven. All right, let me get us loaded here. I did have it on the desktop, but it's not there anymore. Yeah, that's the procurement code. I don't see the presentation that I had on there as well. So I'm just, I'm gonna pull that up. I had them both on there on top of each other. Unless you see it somewhere else on there. I put it on the desktop over here. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to the fire right now. Okay. Yeah, let me do that instead of digging through that. Thank you. Does that wait till we do that? It's all right. Take a little bit of extra time. I guess. Yes. We can yell at him tomorrow. <laughs> oh, we will. <laughs> Patrick. Patrick. Who's saying that? I just saved okay. it. I saved the PDF. What's that? I saved the PDF on the S drive in that temp folder. Uh -huh. You should be able to access it. Am I doing it as a PDF or as a PowerPoint? Would you prefer? Yeah, I'm almost there. I'm almost to the PowerPoint. Oh, I should, huh? I mean, it's easier to look at. I really want to bring up the PowerPoint. <laughs> I really just want to do it that way. There it is. Thank you. All right. So that's the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let me get my readers out here. <laughs> All right. Honorable Mayor, Honorable Vice Mayor, and honorable, honorable Council Members, Patrick Brown, your Purchasing Director. I'm here once again to talk about everybody's favorite subject, procurement. Um, tonight, I am going to present to you some procurement code revisions for your considerations, uh, review and revisions if you have them. Per the city, Flagstaff City Code, Chapter 1, we have to bring all revisions to the procurement code manual to council as a resolution for approval. So tonight, we're going to talk about it so that you have a preview of it for next week. Um, so periodically, purchasing staff will go through the procurement code manual and update it to current practices or anything or adjust the policy to meet city needs. Uh, things change that over time, and we need to change with it. Uh, in this case, we reviewed articles one through seven. We've made some revisions to those articles, and we'll be reviewing those articles tonight. And then whatever comes out tonight, if there's revisions from council, if not, I'll be coming back to you with it as a resolution to adopt it into the procurement code manual. Quick overview. Uh, Resolution to these uh, amendments, or resolution to these amendments will be next week. Um, I'll give you a prelude to the presentation on the next page. Um, we'll discuss revised articles for the amending the procurement code manual. Uh, give, uh, we'll review the amendment revisions one through seven. Then towards the end of the presentation, pretty near the end, we'll discuss future re uh, revisions for amending the procurement code that uh, procurement has in mind. So the prelude. Um, articles to the amendments. So we're review revising the procurement code manual in sections. So we're doing one through seven in this case. There's actually 31 articles total in the procurement code manual, and we didn't feel like bringing all 31 articles to you tonight. So <laughs> you're very welcome. Um, so we thought one through seven would be good. We'll get a flavor tonight. If we can handle more, maybe we'll do more. But we've got some specific ones we want to look at for next time. Um, not all articles have revisions. So we say one through seven. And we say one through seven because that's the bulk or the group that we're bringing to you. Not all of the articles are revised. Uh, most of them are, but not everything in the articles are revised either. So it, for the full amendments, full revisions, I've also attached to the staff summary uh, a full spectrum of the revisions in the full procurement code manual to take a look at. Uh, tonight I'm only going over substantive amendments or revisions that I, might be important to you or have higher interest. Most of them are going to be administrative, changing words here and there. And I didn't think you wanted to see every single word that we're changing. Uh, so move on. So Article 1, uh, Section C, speaks to the purchasing, 
purchasing director's delegation of procurement powers to staff. Basically, it's, it's purchasing, giving the purchasing powers to my staff to do procurements. Uh, in this revision, we've just changed it from uh, saying purchasing staff to calling out those actual titles within there. So we have the uh, purchasing manager, senior procurement specialist, procurement specialist, and buyers. And then we also change the to procurement. That's what I was talking about, those administrative things that you may not be too interested in. Um, we're revising language to identify those titles and then moving on to Article 2 for applicability. So, so as you can see here, Article 1 is not fully here. We may have some other little revisions, but they're little. They're not like word revisions that maybe we don't want to really put into a PowerPoint presentation. Article 2 for applicability. Um, this is to uh, clarify Article 2, Section E, Paragraph 2, the intent of that article and section. So basically what this is saying is that the risk manager and the city attorney have the authority to contract with somebody when it, it has to deal with litigation or settlements, that kind of thing. So for example, um, if we're in litigation with somebody and our attorneys feel there's an expert witness they need to have at the trial, they can contract with them. There doesn't have to be a procurement process because an expert witness is pretty much a sole source. Definitions, next couple of pages, we're gonna go for, through a, a slew of some definitions. Uh, Article four for the definitions, they support various processes and procedures throughout the manual. So these aren't really process or procedure changes. We're adding some definitions to help support what's already in there, as well as support what we intend to put in there later. Um, so you'll see here competition and practicable. What that means is when the uh, competitive procurement process, the formal competitive procurement process is impractical to put out on the street for the normal procurement process. And this is outside of an emergency. Uh, in an emergency, we can pretty much direct select, but when there's an urgency and immediate need and it's um, high profile, we may be able to use this. And a good example you've heard recently is our MRF or our materials recycling facility. So Norton Environmental pulled out. We needed somebody to haul our recycles down to Phoenix. It's not an emergency. There's no threat to the health, safety, or welfare of our citizens, but we can't just keep putting recycles into that building, so we have an immediate need. We use this as a means to hire a transport company to transport it down to Phoenix for us. Cooperative purchase contracts. We bring those to you. I'm sure you've seen them a lot. You'll see a bunch next week, too. So we, you, we have processes and procedures in our manual for co or cooperative purchases, but we don't give a definition up front. So we're just putting our definition up front to help support that process and procedure. Electronic transactions. So the procurement code talks a lot about saving documents in a file or soliciting for documents and people turning in hard bids. Well, we've gone away from that. We do everything electronically now. Uh, so we're, we're going to be putting in, this is where I say we plan on putting in, in the future uh, articles, some uh, pro process and procedures for electronic bidding or uh, solicitations and electronic filing. This is, electronic transaction is there to help support that for when we get to that. And if uh, council prefers me to read each one of these, I'm happy to do so. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to just make that assumption, but I guess I did. Um, emergency purchase. Again, we have the process and the procedure in the procurement code manual in article 19, but of course we didn't define it up front before we got to it. So we have emergency purchase. Again, that's for uh, procurements that is an immediate threat to the health, safety, and welfare of citizens and or staff if it's a, something in the facility. Grant, uh, we talk about grant. I think you need to um, 
I think you're right, sorry. <laughs> I just moved over on my page. I'm surprised it doesn't automatically do that with my eyes, I don't know. Um, thank you for that. So Grant, as you'll see there in the middle, um, we talk about grants throughout the procurement code manual uh, and how they relate to our processes and procedures. So it's important that we define it as well. And then online bidding, and I, I wanna make a caveat right here that I'm, I'm going to um, make a revision to this revision before next week. Online bidding is inaccurate. Bidding is a procurement type. Bidding is a procurement type. There's also request for proposals and RSOQs. This will be changed to online solicitations. Uh, and everywhere you see in that definition where it says bids or bidding, it'll be changed to sol solicitations or submittals. Uh, more definitions. So you've seen these in my Purchasing 101 uh, presentation on April 11th. I, I like to get the acronyms in front of people as much as possible because they, they all think they're interchangeable. Bids are RFPs, RFPs are RSOQs. Um, so I went ahead and put this in here, just more definition, just to keep it in front of you, what an invitation for bid is and what a request for proposal or, or request for statement of qualifications and what d differentiates them between each other. So I wanted to put that in this presentation and in your packet as well. Unauthorized purchase. So in Article 5, these two items are re we're revising the language, and this is where it gets a little more, um, more important to be in here, something of interest. We're changing the language from stating that the formal threshold is $50,000, which it is currently, to uh, the formal threshold as described in the uh, city charter. And the reason I'm doing that, and you all may remember, we're going to uh, present to voters some changes to the charter, which we're hoping to raise that formal threshold to $100,000. Well, I wanted to change it to this so that if it passes, or when it passes, um, we don't have to come back to you again for another change. And it will hold true for any other um, purchasing directors out there that uh, change it in the future. And you'll see the same type of language as we go through Article 7. Oh, so let's talk about Article 7. Um, Article 7, on Section A, we're talking about the informal procurement limit. So here, we're talking about um, the informal, anything under 50,000. That's what we have here. So procurement, I'm going to go ahead and read this because it's, it's important. Procurement of any material services, leases, or construction services less than the formal threshold, there's that language again, as described in the city charter, shall be made by formal procedures. Um, item two, the purchases less than the formal threshold in the city charter may be made utilizing a formal process if, and the difference between those two is, the other one says, we'll do it in an informal process, but the second one says we may do it as a formal process, and here's why. Um, if it's deemed by the purchasing director to be in the interest of the city or deemed by the city manager as a matter of high community interest and or potential controversy or in instances that the city manager deems necessary. So uh, Mr. Clifton, city manager Clifton can come to us and say, you know, we need to put this out formally. It's that important. Patrick, oh, go ahead, Greg. Is this a good time for a comment, Mayor? Yes. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for walking us through this. I just wanted to give a little more context to what you just described. This has garnered a lot of discussion at the staff level and, and frankly, stemming from previous discussions with council, either at the dais or individually. Uh, and there have been interest or in, incidents or, not, or events or topics rather that have um, been of interest to the council but have not found their way to the dais because we were under the threshold. Uh, we have, th this is a very a meaningful amendment that will now going forward enable uh, the manager's office 
for the purchasing manager's office, purchasing director's office uh, to bring things in front of the council even if they don't meet the threshold requirement. And uh, you can think of instances where uh, in the past where that would have been convenient and appropriate. Um, so this is an important uh, change and one that we think reflects council's ob objectives, also reflects the, the need for more transparency on matters of high interest. We also think it's important to highlight this at, at the same time that we're talking about increasing the threshold because what this add-on provision does under section two is give some assurance that even with a higher threshold, council will see items of high community interest or of potential controversial interest. Just wanted to offer that explanation, thanks. Thank you. And Patrick, mm -hmm. do I understand correctly that your process essentially remains the same, what you're, I mean, the, the, okay, let me just say it. Your process remains the same. The thing that changes is whether you bring it forward to council for an official vote or, or um, approval. Correct. So we have two instances here. In the next slide, we'll go a little bit further into that as well. So this slide is talking about um, the process of soliciting. So in this instance, uh, myself and city manager can say, we need to put this out formally. We need to do a formal procurement on this rather than the informal where we obtain quotes, that kind of thing. Let's put it out there for everybody to see and let's do a formal process. And that's a good segue into the next. Oh, Council ahead. Member McCarthy has a question. Well, a key part of that is that it'll become, it would come before council as opposed to it would just go through administratively. Correct. 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 And I can think of at least one case since I've been on council, which I don't need to bring up, but uh, where it was under the amount, but um, it should have come before council because it was politically sensitive. Correct. And, and Mr. Clifton has this uh, policy of when in doubt, bring it to council, and that's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, and again, great segue to this next slide. So this next slide talks about the informal limit. So you'll see here that it says that the informal limit under 50,000 right now uh, are not required to be approved and awarded by city council. However, we're adding item four. The city manager reserves the authority to bring any contract resor resulting from an informal procurement to the city council to obtain input in matters of high community interest and or potential controversy, or in instances that the city manager deems necessary. So the first part was talking about the way we procure it. The second one was, hey, we're taking it to council. Okay, so the next one, we're talking about the formal limit, the formal procurement limit. So procurements of any, any procurements uh, at the formal threshold, there's that language, as described in the city charter, shall be made by formal process. And we know that. That has to go out on an RFP, IFB, RSOQ, what have you. Um, and then number two talks about any materials, basically any procurement at the formal, formal threshold as described by city char charter or higher are required to be approved and awarded by city council. So we're, the only thing in these two is changing that uh, 50,000 to uh, formal threshold by the charter. But I wanted to put them in here so that you can see that it's in the charter that we, we have to bring these things to you. <clears throat> Article seven, this is kind of a busy slide. Um, this is the informal process. So. On uh, April 11th, when we went through the Procurement 101, I introduced to you or showed you the threshold within the informal process. And in that, uh, we had limits that were up to 5,000 as a direct select, 
5,000 to 15,000 was a verbal with documented quotes. And then 15,000 to 50,000 or 49,999 uh, are written quotes on company head, letterhead. So here we're changing it a little bit. We're taking out, a, because of times, you, we really don't do a whole lot of verbal quotes and anything. Email provides us everything we need now. Everybody gets quotes via email, so it's a written quote. We're getting written quotes. So we're changing some of the thresholds underneath the uh, 50,000. So we're, item B, we're changing 5,000 to 25,000 for a direct select. And um, when the procurement code was first adopted in 2013, the thresholds we had established made more sense. Um, now things are, goods and services cost so much more and we don't get a whole lot for 5,000 anymore. So while it may seem like 25,000 is robust, um, I, that will carry us for a little while. Um, <clears throat> so with that 25,000, they shall be made in accordance with the following procedures. Purchases less than 25,000, um, the purchasing agent or requesting division or section may direct select the vendor of choice for the purchase of any material services or constructions requested. And then item C goes a little bit further. Um, so 25,000 up to $1 less than the formal threshold by the city charter. And we changed that because of our charter revisions we're asking for. Um, will be conducted, in, uh, it's not in this, but this is talking about three written quotes. So that's three written quotes on their company letterhead and signed by an authorized agent of that company. So anything from right now, 25,000 to 50,000 or 49,999 will require written quotes on their company letterhead. If charter uh, revisions go through, 25,000 up to 100,000 or 99,900, 900, 99,000, 900, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're, this is, it's revising that, that um, first threshold. We've cut out the verbal altogether and we went from direct select right to written. Okay, informal and formal limits. So this slide is just talking about the requirement for us to have uh, these things on file. Anything over twenty-five thousand and one dollar up to the general th or the formal threshold, we need to have in the procurement code or in the procurement file uh, somewhere. We have to have it filed in our procurement files. So we have to have all that documentation in there, and that's what this is saying right here. The next one. So that's actual articles one through seven are revisions. Before I go on to future, are there any questions or concerns? All right. So future things that we're looking at, purchasing is looking at, and we've kind of had some conversations about this. Um, we want to help support a couple of um, actions that the city is undergoing. Right now it's the climate emergency. So for future revisions, we're gonna look at climate action and carbon neutrality um, I spoke with Nicole Antonopoulos a little bit. Um, we've had a, a quick phone call. It wasn't quick, but we, we chatted about this and what it looks like. Right now what we're, we're looking at is a multi-tiered approach to update, enhance the sustainable purchasing policy. We have um, some sustainable language in our procurement co uh, code, but it's minimal. Um, we wanna bolster that up. It's Article 27. It's brief and limited, so we, wanna, we want to expand that, but we also want to make sure that we're covering everything we need to cover for the climate emergency. Um, we're going to be looking at guiding principles, policy objectives, um, the environmental, social, and economic impacts, uh, roles and responsibilities, identifying those in the procurement code manual, and then a procedure review, who reviews that stuff. So this is what Nicole and I have kind of identified how we want to approach this and what we want to look at for the climate emergency.
um, as I stated, purchasing's working with sustainability. Um, we're gonna research best practices in other leading public agencies. We're gonna develop a framework and identify appro the appropriate procurement code manual. Like I said, we have Article 27, but maybe it's not appropriate there, it doesn't really fit, or maybe we need to make it its own article in the procurement code manual. Article 32, sustainability or climate action. Um, we just don't know what that looks like yet. Uh, we'll conduct peer and uh, public reviews and we'll establish a more detailed timeline. And in the next slide, you'll see I have timeline in there, but it's a tentative timeline. And there it is, tentative timeline. Um, so purchasing and sustainability are gonna meet mid-July to kick this off. We're gonna start developing our plan of attack. Um, what we see is we're gonna do some research with other municipalities in August. We'll canvas what other people are doing. And then we wanna develop a team of experts. And we wanna do that in September. Uh, it'll, right now we, we've identified that we'll wanna have sustainable colleagues on there from both public and private sector. Uh, procurement colleagues from public and private sector. And then we'll, we'll also have a legal colleague on there um, to help assist us, make sure, help us navigate through uh, what we're doing. And then from that, we hope to establish a more detailed timeline in mid-September. Um, again, this is a tentative timeline. This is what we think we can do. Um, we'll see when we get there. And then our goal is to bring something to council uh, for a procurement code revision uh, sometime around the first quarter of calendar year 2024. And then finally, our other future revisions. Um, we also wanted to take a look at our other emergency, our housing emergency, and see what we can do. Um, housing and procurement policy, we're not sure how that fits yet. Uh, so. I'm going to meet with our housing folks, chat about that, see what that looks like with them. They know I'm coming, I've already called and talked to them. Um, we're gonna research, or I'm gonna research other municipalities, see if they have something, what that looks like, how it's working, um, see if it's something we wanna try to incorporate into our policy. And then we'll research what vendors and contractors might see, be seeing out there. So instead of looking at it through the lens of just the public agency, we, I wanna take a look through the contractors who are out there building the stuff or working with other agencies, see if they can give us a bit of insight to what's going on out there. Maybe we can pull something out of that. And then of course right now the timeline's undetermined because I'm, I really don't know what I'm going after or how it incorporates with the, the procurement code policy. I do know I wanna pursue it because if I don't, we absolutely won't have anything in there. So. We're gonna pursue that and see what we can find. And with that, are there any questions? Thank you so much for um, targeting the points that council has um, asked for previously. It's exciting to see a timeline mm -hmm. and um, I just appreciate that there's movement on it. You're very welcome. These are important things. And I know council has made it very known that uh, climate and housing are very important to them and for our citizens and our community. So we want to do what we can do to support that. Council, questions, comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. All right, I don't see any public participation at this point, so we're going to move on to informational items two from Mayor, Council, and City Manager, future agenda item requests. And I will start with Council Member McCarthy. I don't have anything tonight, Mayor, thank you. Council Member Sweet. Thank you, Mayor, I'll try and make this quick. Let's see, last Friday I took the tour of the Wildcat Hill wastewater plant and it was a great discussion to see the future and the challenges we're facing. Sunday I attended the fundraiser at Warner's Nursery for the High Country Humane. This was a beautiful event with lots of money raised. And yesterday I stopped by the mayor's office 
we did a mural unveiling and I'm just so proud of Kaylee Quick and her team. They did an amazing job. The mural is beautiful. You should all stop by and see it. And then this Friday, I'll be attending the graduation of our newest firefighters serving the greater Flagstaff region. And after that, I'll be heading to Heritage Square, hopefully with all of you, to see Jumanji. And uh, it's a, one of the free events for um, the community provided by the Downtown Business Alliance. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember House. Thank you, Mayor. Just briefly, um, last week with the, uh, actually through the Live Black Experience project, um, I had the opportunity to chat with um, Erica Alexander, who was born in Winslow, Arizona, but was also raised in Flagstaff, Arizona for a time. Um, and she spoke just very highly of her experience and the impact that Flagstaff in Northern Arizona had on her. Um, so I wanted to um, raise that because she will be actually coming to Flagstaff towards the end of August um, to engage with our community, to celebrate the impact that Flagstaff has had on her and her family, and also uh, reflect on um, how Flagstaff has changed since the time that she was here. So it's going to be very interesting and engaging conversations and a great opportunity for us to engage um, with a renowned actress, entrepreneur, uh, uh, philanthropist, so many buckets that she, she um, and roles that she fills for community. Um, so I think it's gonna be a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. Um, last week I attended our monthly um, Mountain Line meeting it was, uh, have, has a lot of good conversations coming up. And then uh, this Friday, I will participate in a, I think it's a monthly, maybe bi-monthly uh, conversation through NALA for community health and civility. And I'm looking forward to that engagement. And then as well, later that afternoon, the recruitment um, graduation. I'm looking forward to that as well. And the movies. And the cleanup. Councilmember Harris. I'll be attending the movie. <laughs> Vice Mayor. The only thing I'd like to mention right now is uh, almost all day retreat this coming Friday um, for the Coconino Plateau Water Advisory Council. Um, I believe Joanne's going to be there with us, helping to facilitate. Uh, look back at Greg. I hope you'll be joining us as well. And, and uh, others are welcome and invited. It's going to be a look back uh, at the Coconino Plateau Water Advisory Partnerships past, um, doing a little bit of soul searching and vision casting. And if you need the location for that, please ask me. I'll get it to you um, shortly. It's in Mountain Air at the Highlands Fire District Station. Um, and it will start at, oh man, I don't know when it starts. I think it's 9 a.m. 9 a.m., yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of things. First, I took a great tour of Kender Camp, and this Thursday I'll be going to the Bridging Over uh, ceremony, which is their graduation, and it's going to be adorable. And um, Councilmember Sweet and I took the Lunar Rover tour at USGS, and it was so good. I, I recommend that all of you go do it, and um, as well as the public. You have to make an appointment at this point to see it, but it is, it is definitely worth seeing. Um, Last week, Governor Hobbs was here for many, many meetings, and um, I was fortunate enough to meet with her along with Councilmember Harris and Councilmember House and our city manager and our deputy city manager, Joanne Keene, and um, Councilmembers Harris and House did a fantastic job talking to the governor about our housing needs here locally. We did have a great mural reception, and um, I think my favorite part yesterday evening was the families and their reaction to the work that their students did. It was pretty awesome. 
There is a watershed cleanup this Saturday, July 1st, 9 to 11. Sounds like I've got Councilmember Sweet and Councilmember Matthews and City Manager. If you all wanna have some fun, that's the place to be with us on July 1st. Um, on July 1st, we are also sponsoring, the City Council is sponsoring Movies on the Square, and I'm pretty excited about this. And Councilmember House, I looked it up, and it is the new Jumanji with the rock. So it's Welcome to the Jungle. Um, live music and activities start at 4, and then the movie starts at dusk. So hopefully all of us or most of us can be there. We'll be sponsoring another one later on in the year. And um, just a reminder that our next council meeting is Monday. This is more for the public. Our council meeting is going to be Monday, July 3rd, because the 4th is a holiday. And then there will be no city council meetings for July or August. But I know some of us are hoping to get away for part of it, but all of us will be here for some of it, for sure. So that's it. Thank you. Councilmember McCarthy. I think we do have one council meeting in late August. Am I not correct? Yeah, but like the last week or something. Like the last Monday of August. Okay, thank you. And then as far as the movie, uh, be there around four? For, um, yeah, let, let me clarify with DBA and confirm with you all what time we should be there. Uh, you send us an email or something. Thank you. Vice, uh, Vice Mayor. Oh, my goodness. Um, city Manager. I, I like that promotion. <laughs> Mayor and Council, if we go two more minutes, I'm going to lose this bet to Sterling. I have nothing to say. We're adjourned. <laughs>